I do think markets have sort of priced in a lot here. Yes, equity markets have had a hard run of it in the month of March and now April. Unless we get a deep recession, there's a limit to how much equities will fall from here. The Fed looks at the, the equity markets very, very closely. They don't want to destabilize them. We could target a stable 4% inflation rate if we wanted to, or a stable 2%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures correcting lower by six tenths of 1%. TK after a massive move in yesterday's session. Massive move off of it. It came off the 75 beep chit chat. I guess Mr. Pollard put in the timeout chair. Uh, but then, John, I'd also suggest a real comfort about how the Fed will address neutrality as we head up towards the great mystery. Uh, which is neutrality. There was no mystery to the market, John. Really, what a lift. What a move in the long end of the curve. Equities up, yields down, particularly at the front end as well, Tom. I was surprised. <clears throat> I have to admit I was surprised by just how much Chairman Powell clarified the rate path through the summer. Yes. Well, the rate path is a way to talk about it. We'll go into it. We've got Andrew Sheets, among others, joining uh, across surveillance this morning. And I, but I, I would also note hydrocarbons as well. John, can we note as we go to ba Bank of England today, oil, 111 a barrel. That's been unspoken. WTI just short of 108 at 107.91 as well, Tom. <clears throat> I'll keep an eye on that too. Lisa, as Tom pointed out, the Fed behind of us, the Bank of England right in front of us. And they have a harder path, right? I mean, this is going to be a much more difficult meeting in an hour and then an hour and a half when we get the press conference because they're going to be hiking into slowing growth. We had Jay Powell yesterday come out and talk about the strength in the economy, how he is still confident that perhaps they can get a softish landing. It is softish, though, now and not even soft. But the Bank of England has a harder, harder thing to do. Is that the word? we're using now? Soft dish. Soft dish. Yeah, yeah. Soft landing was it before. Now it's soft dish. <clears throat> Maybe. Do we know what that is? Yep. Then it's going to be really challenging to get there. It means that he's losing conviction that he's going to be able to orchestrate this. As a lot of people say, it's going to be tough. Well, we've got to catch up with some important voices through the next few hours. Let's get straight to the price action this morning. Good morning to you. What a move yesterday on the S&P 500. The biggest one day move higher going all the way back to 2020. This morning down by six tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq 100 down eight tenths of one percent. Yields are by a couple of basis points after moving lower through yesterday. 295.22 on a 10 year and the euro back at 106 Bramo. 106 euro dollar negative two tenths of one percent. Honestly, this has been a moving target. I really want to understand what the reaction function is when the ECB comes out with their rate decision, arguably even tougher than the Bank of England as they try to grapple with also the FX moves and how that influences their economy. All right, 7 a.m. That is the Bank of England rate decision. 7.30 a.m. We get that uh, news conference following it. CPI in the United Kingdom climbed to the highest level since 1992, 7% uh, in the latest read. Again, high inflation, but you get a sense of the slowing growth, and this is reflected in real rates that are still severely negative. You've got the actual two-year yield in the United Kingdom still only at about 1.6%, so not exactly climbing to the levels that you would expect. So how do you, Julia, justify this? At 8.30 a.m. in the United States, U.S. April initial jobless claims, we talk about a tight labor market. Jay Powell talked a lot about about that. What about the participation rate? When do we start talking about the fact that a lot of people, at least by this measure, are still not back in the workforce compared to pre-pandemic? This is sort of underpinning the mystery in this market at a time of record high job openings. And today, OPEC Plus convenes virtually for its regular meetings to talk about output. They are expected to marginally increase output. But I got to say, John, they are not actually achieving those increases in output. It has been more difficult because of how tight supplies are and, frankly, because of some of the uh, disruptions and hang-ups in terms of how quickly they can bring things back on. This, to me, is one of the biggest questions underpinning the recent rally <coughs> in crude, given the fact that we don't know how much supply could even be available at a moment's notice, should it be allowed. How fast do you think this meeting will be? <laughs> I think they'll go to 15 minutes. I don't 20. know. It's going to be bold. It's just depressing trying to take them seriously at the moment, given how short those meetings have been. Lisa, thank you. TK, looking ahead to the Bank of England, this is what Kit Jukes had to say. Yeah, Little scope that. for a hawkish shock. He went on to say what it does have scope for is economic disappointment. He said that cable, <laughs> that's the pound sterling against yeah. the US dollar, <laughs> is more in danger of breaking 120 than euro dollar is of breaking parity. Well, part of this is an island nation with limited... With, with limited 
optionality. John, his degrees of freedom into this meeting this morning are very different than Lagarde or Powell. He's just got fewer choices to make, and no one ever likes to do that. Sterling training right now at $1.2575. Looking forward to bringing in that decision a little bit later. We still need to talk about Chairman Powell. Just a couple of words, burying a 75 basis point rate hike possibility later this year. Take a listen. 75 basis point uh, in an increase is not something the committee is actively considering. Assuming that economic and financial conditions evolve in, in ways that are consistent with our expectations. And that is all it took to spark a massive rally in this market. TK, I think that tells you more about how this market was priced going into this meeting yes. than perhaps anything else. I featured that chart uh, 20 minutes ago with a 5 a.m. hour, John. I'm going to be direct about it. What we saw yesterday, folks, was an absolute textbook, deeply discounted market, just reacting up to the middle. We almost got back, John, on Standard & Poor's 500. We almost got back to the center tendency of the recent volatility of SPX. And so, you know, now what from here? I think you're going to see a lot of people publishing into the weekend, particularly after that jobs report. Let's get to the now what. With Hugo Rogers, the CIO <clears throat> at Dowtech Bank and Trust. Hugo, great to catch up with you, buddy. Let's start here. What changed for you yesterday afternoon? Well, I mean, we moved from the market thinking that the Fed was, um, was being prudent and practical to the Fed being in a panic mode. And, um, and Chairman Powell just wound that back. He said, no, 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 we're not panicking. We're, we're going to make steady rate increases. They're going to be fast. They're going to be front end loaded. Um, but 75 basis points, that's. Um, that, that's, uh, that reeks of panic. So he wound back from that. That was one big thing. But uh, <clears throat> we speak about the framework of, of the tightening. There was, there was no sort of rollback of, of consistent and front-end loaded rate increases. So it was, uh, it was, it was a move... We're not panicking, but um, but we are still tightening uh, at an aggressive pace, really. Hugo, if we get a new rate regime, wherever that rate regime is, do you have a confidence across corporations, and particularly American corporations, that they can adapt to a new rate level, dare I say, even a positive real yield? Um, I would say no, really. Mind your eye with that, because it's not just the architecture of rates. It's all the second tier effects there. It's um, the Fed, when it was at a zero bound, was actually manipulating, maybe too strong, but controlling large parts of, of the market through things like um, suppressing volatility. It was uh, volatility is analogous to rates when, when you're at the zero bound. They were suppressing volatility and buying through the curve. So the volatility of rates move, that's up, that's permanently elevated. The, 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 the era that we've been in, that's gone. VIX elevated, you know, we, we saw a VIX up at 35. When it comes, it doesn't go back down below 20. So uh, spreads, there's a whole raft of effects. We haven't even spoke about the, the effect you were touching on just there. Um, currency, currency volatility and weakness in, in, in other uh, currencies. It is against the dollar. So there is a, an entire framework of second tier effects that, um, no, the corporate world is not ready to start digesting, I don't think. So what are the consequences of that? Well, yes, the trend is, I'm afraid, not your friend in risk assets. You have a money is not, is obviously not free, but, um, but the, effectively the spreads against that base rate are widening too. So the cost of money is moving from not free to fairly priced. It, we think it'll get expensive. So uh, uh, companies that are reliant on zero cost of capital into perpetuity are toast in our mind. Well, but the reason why I ask is because yesterday it felt like people were just trading the tail risk, right? They basically were trading on the idea of the possibility of a 75 basis point rate hike more than anything else that Jay Powell had to say. What does that tell you about positioning and about what you want to do in the next couple of months? Well, it's an excellent question because, you know, you always have to frame that, the, the, you know, the, the timing is, it, the here and now is so compelling the people don't realize that in the ARK Innovations ETF, it's down 70% from its high. It's been in a bear market for a year. So it's not what I'm, what I'm talking about with these strained business models and where, where zero cost of capital is discounted in, into perpetuity to justify the valuations. That is, that is um, a road that has been, been traveled for a year. So 
it, it's not a surprise to see these snapback rallies. We there there were very oversold conditions. So yes, in a febrile atmosphere, you, you're getting the, these snapbacks, and and they're to be expected. But the the fundamentals is that liquidity is continuing to drain. You saw the quantitative tightening program starting in June. That's continuing to drain. So. Uh, hopes for these kind of companies staging a revival. We think they're misplaced. Hugo, awesome to get your thoughts the day after. Hugo Rogers there of Downtech Bank and Trust. Thank you, sir. This is the story for a lot of people in this equity market right now. Can they say with comfort, with confidence, <coughs> that we have seen a peak in the front end of this yield curve in the <coughs> Treasury market? <laughs> TK, do you think it's too early to make yeah, that call? I think it's, uh, it's a little bit too early. We've got to wait till Friday on that. As well. That's like picking Man City over Real Madrid. John, we don't have a clue what's going on here. And I think Powell really walked the ballet yesterday of, you know, it's, it's such a cliche, but it's true. Original territory. That's where they are. They're making it up as they go. And he was, this is something, John, this press conference yesterday, he could not have done in his first, say, two quarters. I have to say, Tom, this. I think this has set up a massive Jackson Hole in August. Uh, you mentioned that yesterday. 250 yes. basis it, it, point moves, John, several CPI prints, I mean, then we get to the end of August. The, the problem, John, there is, 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 is they put us, Red Oak Keeper of the Amex puts us in these cabins in the middle of nowhere. And we'll be up at 3 a.m. walking down a dark road with bears out there in the You're road. You're already trying to arrange the journey. You know, I was about to say. Right? Who well, has a little you know, violin? It, 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 I just see the three of us out at Jackson Hole. I'm sure reading, you do. You know, I think Rocky this was part of the plan, Lisa. Oh, it's a tea time. It's <laughs> in a Tom keeps saying they're going to be data dependent. And then it's all about Jackson Hole. Yeah, we've got to get out there. We've got to watch that data that we're dependent upon. Honestly, I think that it will does set up a big Jackson Hole because also this idea of getting to a 2 or 3% neutral rate, does that stick? I, Do they feel like they're getting some success with that at that point? And that will be a point where yeah. they can actually tell. TK, how about that game? Real Madrid. Uh, hey, Did hey, you catch hey, the I end? Know no, I look at La Liga as a much more technical league and a much, you know, the, 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 they were physical. Man City was very physical and they just got worn out. And the, the technicians, keep going. The technicians of Real Madrid came back with a vengeance. Gareth Bale on the bench. Yes. Is that it? Is that the, <laughs> is, is that the match analysis? Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Value <laughs> down a half of 1%. Value add. Oh, a few more hours of value add right here on Bloomberg <laughs> TV and radio. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Fed Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is vowing to do whatever it takes to curb inflation, but he acknowledged it could cause some pain. The Fed re raised interest rates by a half percentage point for the first time in 22 years. Powell said similar moves were on the table for June and July. A Senate committee is expected to approve legislation allowing the U.S. to sue OPEC for manipulating energy markets. That would clear the way for consideration by the full Senate. The so-called NOPEC bill which has been introduced many times before over the past two decades but has never gone anywhere. Now it will be considered with oil prices at historic highs. And Ukraine is accusing Russia of using what it called missile terrorism across the country. Russian forces bombarded railroad stations and other supply line targets throughout Ukraine. Russia's defense minister says that the West is, quote, stuffing Ukraine with weapons. And China may soon reveal more policies intended to rescue the economy, according to government media outlets. Actions to promote investment, shore up exports and support technology platform companies are all on the table. Chinese leaders are promising to meet growth targets without compromising on that tough COVID zero policy. And BMW posted first quarter profit that beat estimates. The German automaker and its rivals have been hampered by that semiconductor shortage and other supply chain issues. So they have shifted production to higher margin models. BMW delivered 6% fewer cars, but revenue rose 17% over the previous year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. What the United States has done with our NATO allies is exactly the right thing to do in confronting Russia. I think the United States and our allies in the Pacific ought to basically form the same kind of alliance in confronting China. We need to be able to make clear to China that if they become aggressive, they're going to, they're going to pay a price as well.
That was Leon Panetta there, the former U.S. Secretary of Defense, sitting down with Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua earlier this morning from New York City <clears> this morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures negative a half of 1% after a major move higher in yesterday's session on both the S&P 500 and on the Nasdaq too. The Nasdaq down about 7 tenths of 1%. The Nasdaq yesterday up more than 3%. Yields up about a basis point or so to 295.03. And I have to say, no major changes on the south side following yesterday's <clears> meeting. <throat> Maybe a little minor one from Goldman. Jan Hatz and the team introducing another 50 basis point hike to the July meeting. That is widely consensus now. They go 50 again, 50 after that. But ultimately, they haven't changed their terminal I, rate forecast, Tom. They've still got that at 3 to 3.25. Well, do, we, do we do that in July? I'm sorry. I don't know. McKee will know this. Do we, do we adjust the dots next time around? June, Tom. Yeah, next Jim. meeting. Yeah. So that's a big deal. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna show their cards, if you will. John, I would suggest it's nonlinear even to July. I, I just, I, I don't buy this idea. It's a lot of free time. Boom, it's done. Then it's difficult. It's going to be very smooth and very nonlinear. A new pressure along the way, and the next meeting is going to be a different pressure, John, than what we saw yesterday. What they've done now, though, is clarify the rate path, I think, yes, through the yes, summer. Yes, yes, June, July, get to August, <clears> and then look at the data over the last two, three months and try and establish what's happening with inflation. That's when you get together at Jackson Hole, you go into the September meeting, and maybe things change, Tom. I don't know. Well, I'm still not entirely convinced that this Fed has moved away from transitory. I know that won't be a popular I, view, but I'm still not entirely convinced that they have. I think I there is some agree. on that committee that still believe you get to the end but, of summer, inflation started to come through a little <clears> bit lower. You start right. to see that movement month on month on month on month, and they can back away. We'll see. But let's close the loop on that. And Jack Fitzpatrick's going like, why are we talking about this? John, this is really important. They haven't given up on transitory, but is it a new transitory back to 3 to 4% inflation or the hope and prayer of getting under 3%? Well, I think the reason I think that, Tom, it's implicit in what they talk about when they say we may have to go above neutral. You either <clears throat> believe you have to go above neutral and take a more restrictive stance or you don't. And if they haven't made a conclusion on that just yet, Tom, there must be some degree of confidence that inflation comes well, in without them ever getting restrictive. That's something we can talk about later. Let's get back to the focus now of inflation. And one of them among pros, and Javier Blas leading on this, is this price of diesel I mentioned earlier. Diesel since the beginning of the pandemic, retail up 88%. Since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, up 36%. Jack Fitzpatrick knows this, as do the people of West Virginia. Jack, we've got more primaries coming up. What will you look for? Uh, in the primaries, uh, uh, I'll be honest, the Ohio ones uh, were some of the most interesting ones I, that, that we've been looking for. What about for. forward uh, here? May 10, West Virginia, right? Uh, yes, uh, I, uh, I, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not quite on the West Virginia primary beat. So I am going to have to okay, lean on fine. my Okay, fine. But the answer over, is we're now into the season. The answer is we're into the season, and we're into the season with new retail diesel, retail gas, retail eggs in aisle four inflation, aren't we? Yes, and that is creating pressure all across, uh, especially the Democratic caucus. You're, you're hearing uh, we're in the early stages, uh, nothing with a clear path to the floor, uh, but pressure to come up with potentially some idea on on rebates uh, for for some people. Uh, there's a, a real challenge, though, because the, the Republican response to anything uh, that Democrats are proposing just to hold people over on gas prices is uh, pointing to the, the Biden administration policies that they don't like, whether it's pipeline development or, or anything else on fossil fuels. Uh, so they're very much locked into a, a very partisan debate over over the actual specifics of gas prices in, in Washington. Jack, there are two sides to the inflation discussion. There's the actual cost of buying goods, and then there's the idea that people are getting paid more. In about two hours, we're going to get an unemployment report that probably shows uh, or the, the latest uh, jobless claims, and then tomorrow we're going to get the jobless report that's probably going to show an unemployment rate of 3.5 percent, which is going to be the lowest going back to the 1960s. Is this being a counterweight, serving as a counterweight in polls? Or is this just basically an ignored feature in a market that's a lot, that's a lot more complicated? It might be an ignored feature. It's something that the White House has tried to play up. 
Uh, although, you know, when you, we've heard them say that the president is going to try to get out on the campaign trail, it, it doesn't appear that that it fixes all the problems. We've heard the president uh, be pretty vocal about understanding that inflation is an issue. Uh, he's talked more and more about trying to reduce the deficit, uh, which is something that some moderates like uh, Senator Manchin have pushed him on. A lot of the rhetoric from the president is uh, conceding that that inflation itself is a major issue and not quite trying to persuade the public uh, that that's just the flip side of the coin to the quick recovery in terms of job creation. Hey, Jack, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Jack Fitzpatrick over in Washington. Just a couple of headlines breaking on Elon Musk and Twitter. <laughs> the headlines read as follows. An amended 13D, and this is it. They've received some equity commitment letters on May 4th, this according to Elon Musk. Got equity commitment letters providing for 7 point. $139 billion. Lisa, the next headline, Elon Musk gets these new commitment letters and is seeking additional financing commitments for the deal. Have we established whether that financing is there yet or not? No, we haven't. It was 54 uh, 20 is the share price, right? This is a big deal. This only gets a very small part of the way there. Does he have the shares that he actually has been liquidating? Is that enough to really cushion some of the equity financing? And does he really need other people to come in? I've been actually really surprised, though, by the institutional interest. And at least on paper, it seems like there are a lot of willing investors. The fact that there aren't more here kind of oh, is a surprise to me. What's a, you know, we all knew this was going to happen, but I think we've codified now that, that Mr. Musk, John, wants to go private and then he wants to go public three years out. How yeah, odd. and look, if you're an investor, Tom, and you see Elon Musk, who basically adds value to everything he touches, you could see why that might be an attractive proposition. You think so? With a date on it, you can put a ball on it given 36 what he's months done with, out. Given what he's done with Tesla. <clears throat> the stock is trading at 49.50 in the pre-market right now, and the offer price is 54.20. So there's a spread there, Lisa. There's about $5 a doubt there. Honestly, a lot of questions, not only just about his ability to get the financing, right? You say, is the financing there? I think that that, uh, you know, five plus dollars of doubt, the difference, the delta and the share price and the offer price tells you a lot. But there's also a question on a regulatory stance, given how vocal he's been and given that this really is called uh, the town hall square of the modern era. He's in talks with Jack Dorsey, of course, the founder of Twitter, to contribute shares to the deal. This one's go. a work in progress. Let's put it that way. We'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Equity futures down a half of 1% on the S&P. Yield time by about a basis point on a 10-year, 294.83. Heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg. What a move yesterday. We talked about it a little bit yesterday afternoon. If we'd all got together and said yes, he will hike rates 50 basis points in May and signaled another two 50 basis point rate hikes. And then we said, but it'll be dovish. Everyone would say, Tom, what have you been drinking? And that's what happened. <clears throat> Futures yeah. are down a half of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq down 7 tenths of 1%. Yesterday, just a massive move as Chairman Powell takes a 75 basis point hike off the table. But he did more than that. He clarified the rate path through the summer and then talked about the need or maybe not the need to get to a more restrictive stance. So can we say with confidence we've peaked on a two year yield? Maybe you can, at least in the short term. This is what the two year looks like right now. 268. Yesterday, the higher the session, 285. The lower the session, just south of 260. That's a big range. And yield started to come in at the front end a whole lot more. Today, up just about four basis points. But are we confident now we don't get that breakout towards 3% at the front end of the yield curve? Given what we were told yesterday, perhaps. But now we get back to the data. The inflation print next week, after that, after that, after that, and into the summer. Things could get a whole lot more interesting. Not just for the Fed, but also for the ECB, with one policymaker this morning saying... That economy is effectively stagnating. What does that mean for when the ECB meets next month, as they all acknowledge they need to wind down QE and get away from negative interest rates? Euro dollar right now, 106. Kit Jukes of Sockgen earlier this morning, he put out a piece and he said, we've got more chance of breaking 120 on cable than we have of euro dollar getting to parity. That call coming at the same time City turns neutral on the US dollar with euro dollar at 106. Sterling right now at 125.59. And the reason for the Kit Jukes call over at Sock Gen, Tom, 
<clears throat> the fact of the matter is we get back to the data in the UK and that's what we've been looking yeah. at for a while. He's expecting economic weakness regardless of what this BOE does and they are hiking into weakness in many people's eyes. Yeah, and the sum of it was I thought he was more weak sterling, John, than weak euro, even talking Absolutely. about a breach of a 120, not predicting a 120, but the tendency there was a struggling United Kingdom. Where's the scope for a bigger move? Yeah. A gap lower, weakness. <clears throat> More scope, apparently, for Kit Jukes to see economic weakness right. come through in the UK and therefore for cable to challenge 120. Oh. That's more likely for him than it is for euro dollar to challenge parity. It is a mix of picking up the pieces from yesterday, but also moving forward. Of course, we do that to Bank of England, which John will give us wonderful wisdom. And Rabila Faruqi joins now, chief U.S. economist at High Frequency Economics, on what Jerome Powell wants to look for in tomorrow's jobs report. Suddenly, it is upon us, Rubila, a jobs report. What will matter to the chairman of the Federal Reserve System? Good morning. Yeah, and, and you know, I think what the message from the Fed has been that the U.S. economy still has a lot of momentum, in particular the job report, uh, the, the employment situation. And we expect to see another solid gain tomorrow, uh, you know, maybe a tick down in the unemployment rate to where it was before the pandemic, a 50-year low. Uh, but I think what we see on participation and wages, that's going to be the focus for the Fed. That is yeah. certainly the focus for us. And, you know, we expect to see uh, an improvement. We've seen an improvement over the last few months, but we're still, you know, <clears throat> roughly one percentage point before we, below where we were before the pandemic. So I think that is a very important um, thing that we, we're going to be parsing through in tomorrow's numbers. The acclaim of HS, HF, uh, HFE and Carl Weinberg and you is linking in rates into the greater economy. Let's do that now. Jobs report, wage information, how will that move the 10-year yield? Yeah, you know, it's difficult to assess right now because there are so many things going on. We do think that, uh, you know, the way the 10-year is responding to what the Fed is doing is, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting dynamic. And I also think that what's happening with balance sheet reduction, I think they're going to move very quickly in a matter of three months. So I do think that, you know, if we see some momentum in the job, uh, in the job, um, in the labor market, which we expect to see. And we see some positive momentum in the U.S. economy, which is also something we expect to see. And we see this balance sheet reduction, you know, all the interest rate hikes going through. Then in our view that maybe there is upward pressure on long-term rates. And uh, But again, you know, what happens in uh, on the global stage, what happens with the war, how much of a safe haven trade we see, uh, all those things are going to play into, the, into uh, how rates respond. Rubila, how much do you think the Fed still has conviction about transitory, about the idea, as John was talking about, that inflation will come down on its own even if they don't tighten materially? So it was interesting that he actually alluded to the fact that inflation, core inflation, core PC is flattening. Now, they've taken, you know, they've been so heavily criticized on this transitory uh, stance and on their stance on inflation in general. <clears throat> That you know, I would I would think that they would hesitate to make any uh, you know definitive comments about it. But what do we expect to see in the CPI? We expect to see a deceleration next week. You know, when we get the numbers. So uh, I don't. Uh, there is some uh, you know deceleration that we expect just because of base effects and you know things normalizing, especially the rotation from goods to services. But we can't. You know, it's very hard to say that inflation is just going to recede especially headline inflation, especially what happens with energy and food prices. And, uh, you know, what's, what, what do we see if we actually see an energy embargo? Uh, you know, those things are going to be very important going forward. So it's really very difficult to say that whether the Fed tightens or not. I do think that they need to move on inflation. They need to move on rates. They also need to prepare for the next downturn, because really, if something goes horribly long or wrong on the U.S. economy and it does tip into a recession. There's nothing on the policy front, monetary or fiscal. Wait, hold on a second, Rubila. Are you basically saying that they need to raise rates so that they can lower them in the next recession? <clears throat> no, I mean, I, I think they need to raise rates because the U.S. economy, the fundamentals of the U.S. economy do allow that. But also, I mean, look at where the U.S. economy is, look at where the labor market is, look at where inflation is. And they are at 75 basis points, 75 to 1%. So I do think that fundamentally they need to move. But also, I mean... It, they need to move in a way that does not cause a recession. They need to move in a way, but I mean, I think that dynamic is where it's very difficult. It's going to be very challenging for them. 
Rabila, uh, uh, Dr. Lane of Trinity College in the ECB, we spoke to him a few days ago, wonderful conversation, is out with headlines, and he talks, no surprise, about gradualism, which is the new measured, and data dependency. I mean, you and Carl Weinberg every day go back and forth. Are we fooling ourselves that these central banks are anything but ex post, that they are completely data dependent, and they just have to wait, unlike the media and global Wall Street that wants to get out front of the moment. And, and I think that's what we're seeing in terms of the guidance that we're getting from Jay Powell and from the Fed. Yes, they have laid out a path in the dot plot, but really what we're talking about is a three to six month you know, time period. It's very difficult right now to forecast anything beyond you know, the next three to four months. And that's been very clear in, uh, you know, how things, how quickly things have changed and all the interconnections that we're seeing uh, in terms of what's happening within the lockdowns in China, supply chains, what's happening with the war in Ukraine. So I do think that we are in a situation that is unique. We are data dependent. And as much as markets would like to get ahead of, of uh, you know, what, cent what central banks are dealing with, it really is a matter of how the data evolves. And that is going to dictate policy action. Let's talk about some of that data, including what's coming tomorrow, which is expected to read, uh, read through to the lowest unemployment rate going back to the 1960s. Is this a good thing or a bad thing for the Fed? Um, you know, it depends on the reasons for why it's happening, right? I mean, if you are seeing participation not go up and the unemployment rate continues to go down, then that is, and that feeds into wages, then that's certainly not something that they want. So I do think that you know, our base case, our baseline remains that we are going to see participation rise. What we're seeing on real disposable incomes, real, uh, real uh, wages, that is still not keeping up with uh, price gains. So I do think there is um, uh, going to be some, you know, on the margin, people are going to start coming back into the labor force. And, you know, uh, so I think that that dynamic is going to play out uh, uh, over coming months. Rubila, great to catch up <laughs> with you. Rubila Faruqi there of High Frequency Economics. Look, TK, you and I have a different perspective on this. My view is that they weren't data dependent at all. They looked at the data, they ignored it. They had a forecast that inflation would ultimately be transitory and they depended on that. They told us they would be data dependent, but they were still forecast dependent. And Governor Quiles has said it now on the record. The <clears throat> former Fed official said this, we would have been better served to start getting on top of it in September. That was hard to do until there was clarity as to what the leadership of the Fed was going forward and what it was going to be. Now, Tom, you tell me, does that sound like a Fed that has been data dependent? That's a former Fed official saying that. Yeah, I, I would agree with it. It is a former Fed official. I would suggest, John, that you make it up as you go and they're gonna rely on data and the answer, you know, with the war of Ukraine, they did not see that coming. They did not see the leg up in agriculture products, et cetera. No one else did as well, to be honest. And the fact is they've been given news offense, which forces them to extend out the timeline on inflation. No question about that. I remember crystal clear, John, the day Ellen Zentner was in some ways criticized for framing inflation as a one quarter, two quarter event. And that's now not to speak for Ms. Zentner, but that's now nine months, a year and a half event. Everything's been extended because of the war. Tom, do you really think this is down to the war in Ukraine? I think that, as Paul Romer said yesterday, we're enjoying, I, you know, two, three, even four once in a lifetime events since August of 2007. I agree with you. It might have exacerbated <clears throat> some issues, Tom. But the idea that that's been a big factor compared to what we had already seen going into the I, end of the year, the start of the year. These trends were in place. I look carefully at log diesel today, and there's no question these trends were in place, as Mr. Quarles says, back in the autumn of last year. There's no question about that. But on a log basis, they have surged across any number of series coming off of February 24th. What's important now, I guess, is where we are and where we're going. And they've normalized 50 basis point rate hikes, Lisa. We've had one, we're set to get another two. Yeah, and as uh, the, uh, frankly, Bank of England follow, I'm really struck by Philip Lane saying that Europe is unlikely to revert to blow target inflation in the near future. It just speaks <clears throat> to the shift, the longer term shift, regardless of the conflicts or not uh, in inflation expectations over the long term. We'll catch up with David Page shortly, the head of macro research at AXA Investment Managers. Looking forward to that. A little softer this morning after a big rally yesterday. This 
is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Elon Musk has received more equity commitment lenders for his Twitter deal, according to a filing. Those letters provide for about $7.2 billion in new financing commitments. The investors include Binance, Brookfield, Fidelity Management, Qatar Holding and Oracle billionaire Larry Ellison. It's the Federal Reserve's most aggressive action in decades to fight inflation. Fed Chair Jerome Powell and other policymakers raised interest rates by a half percentage point and signaled that they would keep raising rates at that pace over the next couple of meetings. Powell implied that the moves could hurt economic growth. OPEC and its allies are expected to ratify another small increase in oil production when they meet today. Their meeting comes a day after the EU announced its plan for a phased ban on Russian crude that sent oil prices surging more than 5%. And Shell posted its highest quarterly earnings in more than a decade. Profit was boosted by high oil and gas prices that more than offset a $3.9 billion accounting charge on Shell's planned exit from Russia. The company says that distributions to investors in the second half could be more than 30% of cash flow from operations. And the price of wheat gained the most in more than three weeks. One of the world's largest exporters, India, is considering whether to restrict shipments. This is at a time when there's growing concern about a food crisis. A heat wave has hurt Indian crops this spring. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. is a broad sense on the committee that additional 50 basis point increases should be on the table at the next couple of meetings. We'll make our decisions meeting by meeting as we learn from incoming data and the evolving outlook for the economy. Chairman Powell there of the Federal Reserve from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane, Lisa Bramberts and Jonathan Farrow. Equities <coughs> tracing a little bit lower, down by six tenths of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq 100, down by almost three quarters of 1% just after a monster move yesterday on the S&P up by almost three percentage points. The biggest one-day pop going back to spring of 2020. Jonathan Goldberg, Credit Suisse, just out, lowering his price target to 4,900 from 5,200. Still seeing upside from here of 13.9%. I'd suggest the cut to the price target's not the story here. It's the upside <clears throat> he still foresees in this market yeah. of 14% yeah. almost, Tom. And that's wow. a pretty big call from wow. where we are. It'll be interesting to see how people adjust. Some more, more by language like Dudley. And others like Hollenhorst, you wonder, John, how they tweak into the weekend. I agree. I'm looking forward to catching up with John a little bit later, Tom. Yeah, it's going to be interesting market. as well. Doug Cass, listening in Florida, comes to the defense of Jonathan Farrow. <laughs> Folks, this is Latin. Here's this Cass. John is correct. The Fed is ex ante. Ex ante is Latin for getting out in front of the theme, the data, the trend, the equation, and ex post, which is codified within Fed history, Meltzer and Bernanke and the rest of them. Ex post is after the fact. Now, some of you know that surveillance Latin is a really important thing. For example, on my my floor here, we you know we do Latin with Tang, and we you know. We like use, you know, epotes, okay. echipere, vitrum, tang. But far more importantly... Can you translate that, Tom? Yeah, I need a glass of tang. Um, okay. Uh, and then also, of That's course, no. we look to the weekend, and of course, we're so wrapped up in the Tots versus Liverpool. You can go as Tottenham, which you with the Latin, I don't know the Latin pronunciation there. Right. Debit Vincere Van Dyke. I mean, uh, Van Dyke's the key. I think the whole thing's been Isn't Latin. Van Dyke the okay. key for Liverpool, John? He's a fantastic defender, Tom. I mean, Just they, they got to get by the guy. They have. But you've got a decent front line, too. I mean, what? how does how does Harry and Son, how does Son and Kane Can we get the Bramble cam up? Van Tyke? Can we please <laughs> no, get no, the Bramble cam really up? Okay. It's really okay. It's good. I'm hands, good. Hands, I'm good. I'm good. Meet Everything's head. good. Hey. Is it? <laughs> Bramble's not happy. I'm so happy. Can Carry I return on, to please. this ex-post, ex ante? Yeah, let's call? go there. It's not necessarily my view. I think the fact that we have a Fed official, a former Fed official, saying it, mm -hmm. that they disregarded the data yes. because of uncertainty about the leadership. I'm just surprised that a bigger <clears throat> deal hasn't been made of that. That is hugely problematic for the leadership of this Fed. 
it, it, if just, other people I, hold that view. And Mr. Cass holds that view, and you you are correct. It is it is it in the zeitgeist? No, but it's out there. Sure. There's no question about that as well. Let's get an opinion on this with Matt, with Axa Investment Managers. David Page was not prepared for this conversation. David, ex ante, ex post. Is this a Fed that was distracted last year? I think it's a Fed that's always been a bit confused about the role of forecasting. Um, Fed Chair Powell has never really wanted to put too much weight on the role of forecasts in his uh, in his policy. Whereas, of course, uh, a central bank that is committing to inflation targeting has to have a view of what's going to happen in terms of the next couple of years um, in the economy. And I think possibly the sort of leadership issue was one of that. How much how much focus to put on where data is now and how much focus to put on where they expected the economy to move once the, the policy changes um, have fully worked their way through the system. Ultimately, David, could you ever be completely data dependent? Isn't the essence of no. transitory a forecast, ultimately? Yeah. I think you have to have, and I think a central bank that's set in monetary policy that you know, famously works over 18 months to two years uh, to fully affect the economy, you have to have an element of forecast and anticipation to your policy moves. And to move just when you see the data um, would be to move too late. And that's, that's sort of what central banking has transformed to over the last couple of decades um, and, and perhaps rode back a little bit um, more recently. David, how did yesterday's meeting change your view, if at all, about how the Fed's going to proceed and what you want to own? Um, so how it's going to proceed, I, th I mean, it was fascinating to me that Fed Chair Powell sort of spelt out how ex this was, you know, the most difficult time to provide forward guidance and then proceeded to give precise forward guidance for the next <laughs> couple of meetings. It seemed a very strange um, uh, position to be in. Um, I think, you know, the data coming out over the next couple of months are going to be key. Payrolls tomorrow, interesting. You know, it, it's, it's absolutely fundamental to the Fed to get a slower labor market, not just a softening in the economy. It's got to translate to a slower uh, labor market. And depending on how quickly that comes through, I think depends on how much the Fed needs to do. And that then, that then feeds into the question of what one owns, because ultimately the Fed's tools are monetary policy, but they transmit through financial conditions. And if we're not seeing sufficient slowdown in the labor market, they need to tighten financial conditions further to generate that slowdown. Uh, and that, that means more pain for risk assets. Where's the biggest asymmetry of risk? Basically, this idea of the Fed being overly hawked, right, that people expect too much of the Fed or that, it, uh, the, that people are perhaps sanguine that the Fed won't have to go further and faster uh, than currently forecast. To our minds, we think that the Fed is likely to stop before, um, before it gets to the rates that are there. You know, we're very clearly seeing a Fed that at the moment is absolutely focused on inflation. And that is quite a big shift in where they've been over the last sort of six to nine months. But that's not to say they can't row back a little bit. And if we do start to see the slowdown that we're expecting coming through in the labor market towards the end of this year, then I think the Fed can start to relax a little bit. I think we have to sort of bear in mind there's a little bit of the Maradona element coming through here as well. Cool. You know, I, I suspect the five-year, five-year inflation, at break-even inflation expectations moving above 260 odd uh, was something that started to unnerve the Fed. And I think they okay. absolutely I, want I, to underpin the fact John, that they've got um, rates, that they've got inflation expectations nailed at that level. John, help me here. What is what the Maradona started, element? David? What, what help? The idea Apologies, is, Tom, so, that you fake going one way, you fake going the other, but ultimately you go in a straight line. That's it. And it's something that ex-Bank of England Governor Mervyn King used to refer to monetary policy. So you don't actually have to move as much as, uh, as much as markets expect because you've signaled that you might and markets do the work for you. So that's very much something that, that, that um, you know, is basically shaping interest rate expectations. David Page of Axa Investment Managers. I stuff I'm not going to hear the end of this. Show. Do you not know who Diego Maradona was, Tom? No. I yes, don't. you do. You, you do. <laughs> I, do I don't believe that. I don't believe John. that. I don't I believe don't. you. Even I, just, I know. I, I know you know Bramo. And I know he knows oh, too. Oh, please, cue the Bramo cam. Bring it up right now. I mean, honestly. Dara very Bramo cam. Come on, there you we know, are, more Latin. You know that Maradona's jersey basically just sold for $9.3 million. That happened yesterday. Yeah, I mean, but that's, so did yeah. Taylor Swift's. <laughs> I don't know about that, uh, Tom. No. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where to go Coming with this. Up. Can you get me, <laughs> John? Right John. Do we have Guy Johnson? John, can you, you get me anyone? a ticket can, can to the... Can he take this box? <laughs> John, can you, you get me, can you get me an NYU commencement ticket <sighs> for Taylor Swift speaking? Why is he speaking in that? 
I didn't know that, Tom. When's That's that what happening? Mrs. Keene wants from, for uh, Mother's Are Day. Are they selling it's, those? I don't know. I don't think you sell those. I think NYU you? will sell it. What's it cost? 70 grand a year, got, Lisa? Got no idea. Surveillance research. You know, the news I'm you sure you'll know. tell us just as the Bank of England rate decision is dropping. <laughs> yeah. about <laughs> Madonna Google has a jersey. I've mean, been doing this with you for a while, Tom. Maradona, not Madonna. Oh, oh Maradona. I'm, I'm pretty okay. used to it, but that was pretty shocking. That's six tenths on the S&P. A Bank of England rate decision coming up. Chori, vertrium, vitrum, Dear tang. Me. Dear me. You done? Yields up three basis points. A 10-year, 296.39. This is Bloomberg. I do think markets have sort of priced in a lot here. Yes, equity markets have had a hard run of it in the month of March and now April. Unless we get a deep recession, there's a limit to how much equities will fall from here. The Fed looks at the, the equity markets very, very closely. They don't want to destabilize them. We could target a stable 4% inflation rate if we wanted to, or a stable 2%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures down seven tenths of 1% on the S&P. Uh, yesterday, we saw a massive move higher off the back of the Federal Reserve decision. We'll get our teeth into that in just a moment. We need to start with the Bank of England as they move interest rates to one full percentage point from the City of London. Here's Guy Johnson. Absolutely. We've raised, as expected, John, uh, up to 1%. That is the um, line in the sand, effectively, for the start of QT as well, quantitative tightening. The, the, the way that the market reacting is reacting right now, John, this is being seen as a marginally hawkish hike. And let me just walk you through the logic behind that. Um, we were expecting... Uh, at least one member of the MPC not to vote for a hike today. That hasn't happened. Uh, basically, you've had three going, uh, three going for a 50 basis point hike uh, and six going for a 25 basis point hike. So more on the 50 basis point hike side than, than anticipated and less on the let's keep things as they are uh, camp. So we are seeing a tick higher in sterling uh, as a result of that um, and then a tick lower, which is interesting. Actually, we've moved up and now we're moving down. What we have seen, though, is a, a, uh, a significant move higher in terms of yields uh, on the UK two year, which is what you're looking at uh, on the screen right now. Um, now we're going to look at where we go from here. So remember, the market is pricing in hikes at every single rate-setting meeting between now and the end of the year. That's five. We're looking at a terminal rate midway through next year of around 2.65%. Is the bank going to deliver on that, I think, is the next question that we have to ask ourselves. And then we have to ask ourselves a question around what is happening here with QT. When is it going to start? How is it going to be sequenced? What is it going to look like in terms of the pace of sales uh, on a monthly basis? So all of that is, is still to be decided here. I'm looking for details uh, on exactly what we're going to see there. But it, at, at the margin, John, yeah. we are seeing a hawkish hike here because we've got that vote count being slightly different to what the market was expecting. Well, Guy, I think we have to talk about the nature of the 50 basis point descent from Haskell, Mann and Saunders. Is that because they have a bigger idea of where rates should end the year? Or do they think we should be front-loading just a little bit more? I'm trying to ask the question, Guy, whether the three individuals that ultimately asked for a 50 basis point hike aren't that far away from the two individuals that don't think we need any more interest rate hikes. Well, I think... I, I think the, the front-loading question, I think, is interesting. Um, this is a, an economy that is clearly going to slow down. Uh, that, is the, that is the concern here. The question is, do we find ourselves in a position here in the UK, John, where if the bank doesn't act and act swiftly, that inflation expectations are going to become unanchored? The bank has this idea that um, ultimately higher inflation is going to be the cure for higher inflation, and it's going to bring inflation back down to target and below target relatively quickly. Um, is there a concern within this? And, and we need to see, we need to break out the numbers that the Bank of England are giving in right. terms of expected inflation, <clears throat> Tom, to be able to understand oh. the answer to that question. I don't know the answer to that question. I think we're going to learn a lot later in the press conference and the subsequent interviews. We're going to stop the show here, folks, because what I see on my Bloomberg screen I've never seen with John Farrow and Guy Johnson from England to the two of you. And John, let me start with you. I have never seen this. 
We have 25 and 50 beeps move, including the giant of MIT, one of our great international economists, Catherine Mann. And I'm looking at growth forecasts that are resoundingly difficult. Bank of England, John, next year yep. goes from a 125 down to 0.25 percent growth. John, I've never seen a rate hike like this into those forecasts ever, ever. It's home. Catherine Mann can speak for herself. But I think overwhelmingly there is consensus that this Bank of England is worried about decelerating growth in the British economy. Mm, yeah. And, Guy, that's why I ask how much distance is there actually between the so-called hawks and the so-called doves on the MPC at the moment? Because I'm not convinced that Saunders, even though she <clears> might have... Man might have joined Saunders and Haskell for a 50 basis point call today, that ultimately they want to take it much further beyond that, Guy, because of what's happening with growth. Yeah, but the, the danger, John, is that, that if... if if inflation becomes unanchored, that is going to be a, an even bigger threat to growth. Uh, and this, I, the Bank of England finds itself in probably the most difficult position amongst the major central banks at the moment. It does have this deceleration. Panetta over at the ECB today was talking about the fact that the, the Eurozone is in de facto stag, stagnation. You, you are definitely seeing that here in the UK at the moment. How do you balance those two issues out? And if you, and if you right. take your foot off the brake when it <clears> comes to rates, do you end up exacerbating the growth slowdown as well? Because they see inflation slowing growth down. So if you let inflation <clears> go too fast, is that growth slowdown going to be even greater? Right. I think that is, that is the battle that they're really challenged with here. Guy Johnson from Queen Victoria Street. Thank you so much this Thanks, morning. Guy. Guy, uh, John Farrell, i got to go to you uh, on this. To me, it's a pressure cooker on the stove that your mother had and you thought it was going to blow up and take out <laughs> half the house. The pressure release valve here is sterling. Does this kind of set of headlines get you to a 120, a 119 weak pound? Well, look at what Cable's doing. Still is weaker by about one percent on the day, threatening to break 125. Lisa, what we're seeing play out here: this division. Some saying that maybe we're done here; they don't see the need for more rate hikes. Some saying we should have done more today. It's just the politics, the economics of stagflation. Ultimately, that we've got weaker growth matched with higher inflation and a central bank that doesn't really know what to do about it. And a bias for some on the committee to say, "Okay, if we're going to have to do a lot, let's front load it, then wait." And honestly, I think that that's really the issue is it's unclear what they can do and there are no good options. I think it's interesting that sterling is actually weakening. That's what I wanted to point out, this idea uh, that even though this perhaps was a more hawkish 25 basis point hike, the response is sort of the opposite of what you would expect. And I wonder, again, whether rate hikes can really uh, fortify the currency, whether that's something they even want, right? I mean, a balance of do you want a strong currency or a weak currency in an era of inflation when you want to uh, boost your economy? And that's a currency, I think, Lisa, responding to the growth outlook. Yes, absolutely. Off the back of the rate outlook, <clears throat> which gets revised just a little bit higher this morning, at least. I want to turn to Sebastian Page on some of this, the chief investment strategist and head of global multi-asset at T. Rowe Price. said this is a tough moment for central banks, and some people might say they got themselves into this mess to some extent. For the UK, they face upside risk to inflation, potentially, and downside risk to growth. Your view on what policy is going to look like in that world, and ultimately what it means for risk assets? No, the discussion on the UK is interesting. I like to look at a, I call it a Bloomberg surveillance measure, the five-year, five-year forward. The five-year, five-year forward inflation in the UK is at around 4.7%. That's high. And compare that to the US, where the five-year, five-year forward is at 3.2%. The signal I'm getting from this is that Growth is even more fragile in the UK, and the view is that the BOE won't be able to be as aggressive at the Fed, and that also feeds into the weakness in the pound that you were just talking about. Will the weakness in the pound actually help the economy or hurt the economy? <clears throat> Look, uh, it can help in terms of exports for sure, but generally speaking, it also feeds into inflation, which then forces the hand of the BOE as well, and then it gets complicated, right? Look, I think if you step back, you look at the big picture, markets got drunk on liquidity post-COVID. And I know, Jonathan, uh, you were talking about Tom being out earlier this week, and you mentioned a hangover. I don't know if, that, oh, if that's you. the case, but right <clears throat> now we're going through a hangover in world capital markets. And it's been remarkable uh, in the sense of both stocks and bonds 
right. being down at the same time. Sterling's through 125 right now, folks. I'm going to call an important level 124.50, 1.2450 on weak pound. We'll see if we get there. Sebastian, with your book, you own the high ground at T. Rowe Price on this. John mentions what's it mean for risk assets. What's it mean for stocks? Does the market valuation, if we get a current set of currency depreciations off of these absolutely historic central bank moments, can the stock market adapt on valuation on multiples to sustain a level market or even a modest single digit bull market? Yeah, really good question, Tom. Look, we entered the year position for this in our tactical portfolios, underweight stocks and within bonds, underweight duration. And what's interesting is we tend to be contrarians. We look at valuation opportunities. We look 12 months out. So <clears> normally, uh, we would be leaning in both stocks and bonds. And what's interesting is not what we're doing, it's what we're not doing, Tom. We're actually buying back treasuries, closing our underweights. We're not closing our underweights in stocks. And I said in surveillance back in November, inflation's the number one risk for markets. I continue to say this, inflation is the number one risk for markets. And the key question that's debated on your show all the time is will the inflation shock lead to a recession, a growth shock. Seb, great to catch up with you, sir. As always, Sebastian Page there at T. Rowe Price. We've got a growth shock in the UK, and these forecasts, as you indicate, Tom, are dreadful for growth into 23. Think about where we were at the start of 22. There were some people in the UK looking for a six-handle on GDP in the UK. That's been revised aggressively lower, and into 23, we've effectively got a Bank of England saying growth's going to stagnate, Tom. They're not, it's not the same economy. It's not even apples and oranges. There's some no, huge course. differences here, including export import dynamics. But, John, take this moment, and you know, our American viewers and listeners are going, well, so what? It's England. This could be an American debate six, eight, nine months from now, is why this is important. And, John, if you get a mix of US GDP forecasts lower, with a Fed that's rising into what, four, five, six percent inflation? Yeah. Maybe that's where you get to the equivalent of this morning in May. Directionally, I think I'd be closer to agreeing. By the same magnitude, perhaps yeah. not. Oh, agreed. You've agreed. got a Bank of England that isn't confident we've seen the peak in <clears throat> inflation by any stretch, Lisa. And you've got a Bank of England that is effectively saying growth is going to get pretty bad. And a central bank that is totally divided about what to do about it. I would love right now, not to hear necessarily from Governor Bailey, just the three that dissented and looked for a 50 basis point move, whether that's just about front loading and then they are done after that, or whether they're going to be pushing for hikes through the rest of the year because of where inflation is. We've been worried that we'd have a Federal Reserve at the end of this year that would have to choose between growth supporting it and inflation curtailing it. That's the decision, Lisa, the Bank of England has to make right now. And this has to do also with the supply chain disruptions and exogenous shocks and how they handle it and whether they actually take the view that the only way to resolve some of the surging uh, inflation is simply to curtail demand. And if they continue to curtail demand, they're going to take that road. I just want to point out that home energy prices rose by another 40 percent in October. This is one of the headlines coming from this, just to give you a sense of what the pressures are. So what will hiking rates actually do to really curtail energy shocks, right? This is all about dampening demand at a time when already post-tax disposable income is declining at an accelerating pace. This is a bad recipe. They are taking one stand. The Fed is not trying to go that same route. Just these numbers from the BOE from Threadneedle Street. TK, I've got to say, I don't think I've ever seen it like this, to see these yes. kind of forecasts. Yeah. To say double-digit inflation, we could hit 10%, and to say in 23, I, the economy could I, shrink. This is absolutely original where we are right now. This is in none of the textbooks. I, I'm sure there's some historian that's going to tell me in 1872 it was like this. John, I don't know. I've never seen what's on the Bloomberg screen right now. John, can we say Sterling is yet to get a bid? 124.77. Yeah, that doesn't look good. What a call from Kit Jukes of Sock Gen. Yeah, I'll for say. this Bank of England call. Let's Sterling right now, $1.24. He, he thinks Tottenham will beat Arsenal. 75. Andrew <clears throat> Sheets and Morgan Stanley coming up in the next hour from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. If that path happens to evolve levels that are 
higher than estimates of neutral, then we will not hesitate to go to, the, to those levels. We won't. If higher rates are required, then we, we won't hesitate to deliver them. That was Chairman Powell. That is so yesterday. Let's get to the Bank of England. What a move we've seen. And let's hope for Chairman Powell this is not in his future. Sterling, negative 1.4%. Cable, 124.57. A 25 basis point rate hike. That is not the news. There were three individuals on the MPC looking for a 50 basis point rate hike. They didn't get it. But look at these forecasts <clears throat> and look what they would have been hiking into if they went 50. Yeah. They believe that inflation could peak at 10.2 percent in the fourth quarter of 22. And they see GDP contracting 0.25 right. percent in 2023. TK, that is a mess of a decision from it's this bank of England. a mess of a decision, and you wonder where the economic theory is, whether it's out of LSE, Cambridge, Oxford, MIT, whatever. Stay on this screen, if you would, on television. On Bloomberg Radio, the way you look at sterling, and every pair is different, is to two or to four digits. So sterling in the pro world, Global Wall Street, the Bloomberg terminal world, is 1.2459. When we went to break, John, it was 1.247x. Those are called pips, like Gladys Knight and the pips. And we are down 20 pips during the break, John. That's a huge, persistent weakness. Coming into this decision a few hours ago, Kit Jukes of SockGen published, and he said this decision has, quote, little scope for a hawker's shock. What it does have scope for is economic disappointment. He said cable is more likely, more in danger of breaking 120 than euro dollar is of breaking parity. And we're not far away, Tom, from it right now, 124.57. Another meeting has become an historic meeting here at the Bank of England. John, a dumb question. Does he do a press conference? I believe we do hear from Governor Bailey. In 10 minutes. All of us, thank you, Lisa. All of a sudden, got all the time. He's for everything. You're asking she the wrong does. guy. I mean, you know, Lisa yeah. knows. No, I'll just sit here with a spreadsheet. Jack Fitzpatrick joins us again from Washington. Jack, I've never seen the cover of the Washington Post. Such a mess. All the different stories. The Supreme Court uproar. You've got uh, the, the election uproar. You've got uh, Johnny Depp and uh, what's her name? I'm sorry. Heard. I can't remember. What a mess down there, Jack, right now. Let's focus. What's the Biden administration focused on? Uh, the Biden administration is, uh, I, I think, trying to turn its focus from a few different issues toward the campaign trail. The immediate stuff, though, uh, that they are clearly focused on and that there, there is at least agreement with lawmakers that they need to focus on is Ukraine. Uh, the question is, uh, if they're going to get a bipartisan <laughs> agreement to help Ukraine to do this bill as soon as next week, the $33 billion requested for Ukraine, uh, how much gets latched on? To that, and that speaks to your uh, what, what you're referring to with the so many different stories that it's difficult to focus on. Yeah. Uh, the combination of uh, Ukraine needs, they had a COVID funding bill stall. Uh, a, a series of other things, the Title 42 immigration uh, decision right. that Republicans have pushed back on and some Democrats. Right now on Capitol right. Hill, all of those have kind of been <clears throat> melded together, and that's the one thing that might right. slow down progress on Ukraine. But Ukraine is, I guess, the, the easiest right. thing for them to focus on because that's where a lot of agreement and, is. And Lisa, I had a brain freeze there. I'm sorry for Ms. Hurd. I couldn't remember her first name. Amber Hurd, Lisa, I loved what she did in Pineapple Express. Honestly, I've just heard from a Bloomberg subscriber, and I've got to quote them. The absolute irony of telling Jack to focus when we just had a Maradona and Tang rant already and it's only 721. He was speaking for all of Lisa, us. Pineapple Express was Oscar worthy. I'm sorry. Continue. I'm focused on jobs, not Pineapple Express right now, Jack. And I'm focused on how the White House is going to spin this labor market report tomorrow. And I know this is going off in left field, but this is what I'm focused on. And I think is really driving the narrative in a nation that is really torn between momentum and inflation. How will the White House spin a, a labor market report that actually is better than expected? Is that actually not optimal for them right now? They they have tried, at least in passing recently, to uh, spin the inflation story and say, look, we were very aggressive in the fiscal response uh, to the recession and the <clears throat> pandemic and got unemployment very, very low. That is not something they have uh, dedicated themselves to as, as their, their messaging focus. Uh, the president has uh, acknowledged the amount of 
bad news and instead of trying to turn everything toward uh, any positive job reports or positive economic news, he has talked about inflation. He's talked about gas prices. So you will probably, if, if there's good news, you'll probably hear them play up the low unemployment in the country, uh, but they have not entirely dedicated themselves to trying to, uh, I guess, turn the page on inflation. They're, they're pretty focused on addressing uh, the, the sort of negative flip side. Hey, Jack, thank you. As always, Dan in Washington, Jack Fitzpatrick there, just running through some of the political news and the economic news of the day. Just got to keep returning to the Bank of England. They are everything the Fed fears it will be months down the road. Everything. This is yes, everything that people yes, worry yes. the Fed could be. I said that, John. You were listening. Months. I was. I replied to it. Oh, That's why okay. I'm going back to it. Oh, thank you. Let's talk about these forecasts. 10.2% the fourth quarter of 22 on CPI. In 23, an economy that's contracting <clears throat> by a little bit. But let's face it, you've got a central bank saying the economy is going to contract. you know how rare that is, Tom? A year out for them to tell you that? I've never seen it. It's just not no. something you typically see. Yeah. And a committee really divided on how much we needed today okay. and whether we should pause now. So what happens at this press conference in six minutes? I mean, is it like a, a Powell press conference? The challenge that any central bank leader has in a news conference like this is to try and reflect a consensus when there isn't one. And he's got to try and do that today. Where's Tom. the consensus? I don't see it. There it, isn't one. Is this voting really like what the Fed is, but the Fed, because the Greenspan's too polite so to have dissent? So this is a bit more nuanced, Tom, so give me a second. Please. I'm not sure how much distance there is between the two that want to pause rate hikes and the three that wanted a bigger hike today. I wonder how many of those three, if they'd got their 50 basis points, would have also said, we need to pause rate hikes. It's going to be interesting to see if we get some clarity yeah, from Governor okay. Bailey on that. We also have to have a deeper understanding of their reaction function going forward from yeah. here, Lisa. If growth really disappoints, yet we are going to see CPI prints like that, are they done? Well, and, and is this a concession that inflation is the biggest concern and that the only way to curtail it is to send the economony into recession, oh, that it's going to go anyway, but this... to then basically push it into something that lowers demand? I, nobody, no banker ever wants to send their, their economy into recession. That, that's, nobody I just wants to, it. but if your priority is inflation eh, and you have a shallower recession in the near term versus a longer term, look, deeper recession, that's actually something very much in the zeitgeist. I have another right now. question, Tom. How does the chancellor respond? To these four I don't know. My emails. What can they do on the fiscal I don't side? Know. John, my email's heating up here, and it's over Madonna here in this jersey. Thank you, Lisa, for the nine million dollar number on the jersey. I mean, I'm looking at Madonna in the nine million dollar jersey. I'm sorry, John, it works. Okay, I'm not responding to that. I'm letting that go. And for our audience on radio, you don't want to know. <laughs> Futures <laughs> negative six tenths of one percent on the S&P. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. We retrace lower, just a little bit negative on the S&P, down 7 tenths of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, down 9 tenths of 1%. Hard to take these moves too seriously off the back of what happened yesterday, which was a massive breakout on the S&P by almost three, four percentage points. The biggest one-day pop going back to spring 2020, in fact, around about two years ago. The story in the bond market looks like this at the front end of the yield curve in the Treasury market. Powell burying the prospect of a 75 basis point rate hike and yields came aggressively lower this morning up by a couple of basis points to 266.47 and some people comfortable confident with the idea that for now the story might have peaked at the front end of the yield curve given the equity investors confidence that maybe we can get a bigger squeeze than what we got <coughs> yesterday through the next several months we'll see but for me the big story right now is on Threadneedle Street it's in London the city of London over at the Bank of England this is what you do not want to be when you grow older you do not want to be the Bank of England if you are the Federal Reserve this year. This is everything the Fed and investors fear. Upside risk to inflation, calling for double-digit inflation year-end, a peak of north of 10%. Downside risk to growth, calling for a contraction in GDP in 2023, a divided committee, and this story right here, sterling, on a day where we get an interest rate hike, negative to 124.42, negative 1.5%. And I have to say, Tom, a news conference with Governor Bailey that's going to be absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's gone from interesting, folks, to historic. I, I will say that. And I really want to make clear, John, talk to me a little bit about this with a 124.41. I mean, it's not Brexit kind of moves and the sweat around that moment in June a number of years ago. But, John, what is the 20, 123 sterling if we get their signal? It signals some real economic pain. 
and that's what Kit Dukes of Sockgen was talking about this morning. This is about <clears throat> a central bank hiking right. into economic weakness. I'm and this, how it's playing out, Tom, is a movie that the ECB right. will be watching with their hands over their eyes. This is something yeah. they don't want to see either. John, explain this to us. As Governor Bailey, a wonderful gentleman, met him a number of times uh, over in London, sits down at the press conference. That is not Governor Bailey on uh, our, our, our radio, uh, but we're doing the introductions here to the gentleman. John, let's just do the compare and contrast of this with Powell and Lagarde. Why is this press conference different? It is different, Tom, because they've had to hike interest rates for all the wrong reasons at a time when growth is going to get a whole lot more painful. <clears throat> Governor Bailey, I think this is probably one of the hardest news conferences he's had to do, Tom, for a long, long time, in fact, yeah. since he's had this position. I think this is as tough <clears throat> as it gets for this governor. Well, it's going to be interesting to see, and folks, again, the visible dissent that you see there, very much different than the Federal Reserve System. Uh, John, the stock market futures at negative 31. Yeah, just a bit softer after the big move high yesterday. We'll return to this story and catch up with Guy Johnson of the city and bring you the headlines from that news conference on Threadneedle Street. Let's get you some movers, though, and catch up this morning with Katie Lines. Morning, Katie. Good morning, John. Well, there are a lot of movers out there this morning, including some positive ones on the back of earnings. Albemarle is one of the big outperformers. It's up about 14 percent. It, of course, is the number one miner of lithium, which is needed for electric vehicles. Demand really strong. Price is up as a result, and that is helping out that company with a beat on its forecast. It was also a beat on the forecast for Sunrun. Sm strong demand for solar products, allowing the company to pass through higher costs. The input costs they are facing, exercising that pricing power. It's up about 12.7 percent and not an earnings story but still an upside mover would be Twitter. This is an Elon Musk story once again securing 7.1 billion dollars more in financing from the likes of Binance, Brookfield and Sequoia. Maybe removes a little bit of doubt about his ability to actually close that 44 billion dollar for Twitter although still even with a 1.6 percent gain this morning we're at 49.85 which is more than four dollars below that deal price of 54.20 a share. As for some downside movers today, Tom, there are a number uh, on the back of earnings, and among them is Etsy and eBay. These are both e-commerce plays, of course, both giving weak forecasts. That pandemic boom in online shopping starting to unwind. They're down 12.9 and 7.6 percent, respectively. And Cognizant Technology, this is an IT services company, cut its gu uh, guidance for top and bottom line. As for the reason why, the company saying on the call that it is because of compensation pressure driven by the continued labor, supply, and demand imbalance. Really interesting commentary out of corporate America ahead of tomorrow's jobs report, Tom. Kaylee, thank you so much. On Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television on Monday and Thursday, no, we've got Bank of England starting the first headline from Governor Bailey saying the Bank of England is navigating a narrow path on policy. We're going to navigate quickly here to distress debt in America. Winnie Caesar joins us now, global head of credit strategy at Credit Suisse, and we'll monitor those Bank of, headline, uh, Bank of England uh, headlines. Uh, Winnie, I look at the Bloomberg total return indexes, full faith in credit, the corporate credit quality market, and where you are, the more distressed market, and I see distressed, negative 8%. Is that a bear market in your world? not a bear market in our world. And actually, distressed at negative 8% is a massive outperformance versus regular way investment grade credit and also higher rated high yield credit. So the distressed market is actually having a comparably decent year so far, although negative total returns. I think we've got some disruption, some technical difficulties here with Winnie Caesar at credit sites, Tom. I'm not sure we're going to be able to reestablish yeah, yeah. that connection anytime soon. And either. because of the moment in England, folks, we'll, we'll get back to Winnie Caesar. It's really, really quite good, as is Lisa Bramlett's away from full faith in credit. I, I mean, very quickly here, Lisa, before John goes back to Bank of England, there seems to be a three part bond market. Do I have that right? Yeah, but I want to link the two, right? Because the scenario that the Bank of England is something that's very scary to both the ECB, but also here in the U.S., people are watching with a wary eye. What does stagflation mean in terms of all of the corporate debt that's been raised? What if the Fed keeps hiking rates and you get weakness in the economy? And I think that's what's keeping a lot of people up at night. And that's what you're seeing in some of the spreads that are starting to widen out, basically a gauge of how much credit risk is increasing. John, I got to say, though, this Bank of England decision is just, uh, oh, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. It's, it's nuts. I think we've got to be careful with the language because they're not forecasting a recession per se. The technical definition, as you know, two quarters, successive quarters of negative growth. They're essentially forecasting stagnation and ultimately a small contraction in the economy next year. But I think the bottom line here 
is this is everything we've been talking about the year so far, which is upside risk to inflation, downside risk to growth, and a central bank that's just caught in a classic <coughs> EM dilemma. What do you do about it? And at first look, they don't really know. They don't really know. But something Governor Bailey's acknowledging right now is that the peak in UK inflation is going to be later than in other economies. We believe here in the United States that we've already seen the peak year over year because of the base effects. You've got a governor here that does not think we've seen the worst of it, that that comes further down the road, Tom. And well, this is really problematic for them as they look to set policy today. Yeah, and I think to frame this, John, and this is important, when the facts change, Governor Bailey's going to change. I believe a guy named Kane said that a few years ago. John, I went and looked at trade-weighted sterling uh, a, a week or two ago. And to get back to the John Major debacle of the early 1990s, it needs to depreciate about 8%. I don't know where that is, but it's way under a 120. It's not that we're getting there, and it's not that we're gloomy, but the vector is in place for weak sterling as of this morning. As of right now, we're seeing one of the biggest one-day moves lower in cable since September 2020. Governor Bailey making another headline here, Lisa, talking about the growth. <clears throat> the UK growth expected to slow sharply. So there's not some smooth glide path here. They're looking for a sharp slowdown in the quarters ahead. How do they then justify raising rates? Is it just that they think that inflation is that much harder for the economy to handle and that much more difficult, that they will do anything to stave that off in the near term? Or basically, are they saying that if they allow the short-term decline or stagnation, does that lead to a softer downturn and a quicker recovery? These are some of the things <laughs> I want to hear from him as he uh, parses through this very difficult decision. Well, again, I think we've also got to think about the other side of London. So this is East London at the Bank of England. Get over to Westminster and think about the Chancellor right now, Tom. How is the Chancellor thinking about this moment as his Bank <clears> of England <throat> is staring down the barrel of economic stagnation over the next 12 months? staring down the barrel of inflation north of 10 percent. Governor Bailey saying he recognises the hardship facing many people in the UK. He's unelected and to some degree unaccountable. It's on for this government. They face a really tough decision. And part of the reason <clears throat> that people like City yeah. are negative on Sterling right now is not just because of this story playing out at the moment, right, right before our eyes. It's because the fiscal offset just isn't there at the moment. Right. Are we going to see one and can they deliver one after what we've seen over the last couple of years? That's where the doubt is. And, John, one of the things I really want to emphasize is, folks, people in fancy suits and ties and bow ties get on the plane at JFK. We go over to London and we think that's England, like we go to Hong Kong or whatever and think that's China. John, exports is a percent of GDP in the United States. I'm going to, you know, 11, 12, 13 percent, whatever the number that is. To the island nation, it's what, 30% of what you're doing? It's a huge, huge difference. And those dynamics, particularly with the continent, we haven't even mentioned Euro sterling dynamics, particularly with the continent. I, I can't say enough, folks, how it's a different challenge for Governor Bailey than it is for Chairman Powell. They all have their own unique problems, but they share a similar dynamic at the moment. And we keep yes. going over this. It's downside growth risks upside inflation risks. We've talked a lot about what this might mean for the Federal Reserve. Will they, won't they experience this in the years to come? For the ECB, I think that's what many officials are grappling with <clears throat> right now, going into June. This is the story they face right now. An economy that, in the words of an official from the ECB this morning, Fabio Panetta, this economy is facing stagnation and an inflation print that is heading in the wrong direction still. And that's the problem the ECB and the BOE have got too, that maybe the Fed does not have. The Fed might have the comfort of getting some inflation right. prints year over year that start to decline <clears throat> in the months ahead. Governor Bailey is telling you today that he does not have that luxury. And John, a bit of history here. I remember the moment where Catherine Mann became acclaimed in economics. She's one of the rare people, folks, who's done not one but two but three giant things in academic economics. A monograph, John, I'm afraid to say how many years ago, she was like 15 when she wrote it, is a trade deficit sustainable? And that speaks to the hundred gajillion dollar trade balance reported by the U.S. yesterday and the challenges that, uh, that, that uh, uh, Dr. Mann and uh, Governor Bailey have. Sterling right now just about clinging on to 124. That's the pound against the U.S. dollar, 124.11 wow. and down by 1.7 percent on that currency wow. pair. Guy Johnson's going to touch base with us very shortly to run us through this news conference. And we'll continue to talk about the possible potential parallels further down the road for what might or might not happen here in America. Futures down on the S&P by six or seven tenths of 1%. This is Bloomberg.
keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Elon Musk has now secured about $7.1 billion of new financing commitments for his proposed $44 billion takeover of Twitter. Amongst the investors named in a filing, Finance, Brookfield Fidelity, Qatar Holdings and Larry Ellison, Revocal Trust. Musk is now in talks with Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey on contributing some of his shares towards the deal. It's the Federal Reserve's most aggressive action in decades to fight inflation. Fed Chair Jerome Powell and other policymakers raised interest rates by a half percentage point and signaled that they would keep raising rates at that pace over the next couple of meetings. Powell implied that the moves could hurt economic growth. And OPEC and its allies are expected to ratify just another small increase in oil production when they meet today. Their meeting comes a day after the EU announced, of course, its plan for a phased ban on Russian crude that sent oil prices surging more than 5%. And Warren Buffett is boosting his bet on Occidental Petroleum. Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has bought up almost 6 million more shares of Occidental. Berkshire had previously built up a stake of more than 14% of the company. Occidental was the best performing stock in the S&P 500 during the first quarter. And the price of wheat gained the most in more than three weeks. One of the world's largest exporters, India, is considering whether to restrict shipments at a time when there is growing concern about a food crisis. A heat wave has hurt Indian crops this spring. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Going back to the 1930s, we have never been able to reduce inflation by more than two and a half percentage points without inducing a recession. So even if we don't get close to the 2% target, it's very likely that we will have some kind of an economic slowdown well before we get to the, uh, the desired inflation target. Scott Miner, the CIO at Guggenheim Global, he wasn't talking about the Bank of England. He might as well be. He was talking about the Fed. From New York City this morning, good morning. Equity futures declining by six-tenths of 1% on the S&P after a big move higher yesterday of almost three full percentage points on the S&P 500. <clears throat> the Nasdaq 100 down by about eight-tenths of 1%. Yields higher by a couple of basis points. The main event, though, looks a little something like this. It's sterling very briefly breaking 124 and having a little look at 123. It's negative 1.8% <clears throat> on the session. All the wrong things, TK, happening in the UK today. It's amazing where Scott Miner talks about the 30s and you wonder what the, per the, the value of a pound was in the 30s, John. Six, seven, eight per uh, dollar. Now we're down where we are, uh, a, a dollar in change as well. 123.99 on sterling. Absolutely stunning. We're going to digress for a moment, come back to the Fed and what we observed yesterday off of the Taylor rule and the great separation of the theory and where we are. Kriti Gupta. Yeah, Tom, a historic day for the Fed yesterday. We had that 50 basis point hike, the first in 22 years. But we talk, we have to talk about how we got here, and that really brings me to my chart of the day. The spread between the Fed funds rate and CPI at the largest <clears throat> ever. For a radio audience, stick with me here. Basically, what you see is going back even to the 70s, a steep drop starting in 2020, essentially when it comes to this spread. It begs the question, is the Federal Reserve behind the curve? We hear that all the time in the commentary. But something that really stuck out to me in the press conference was when Chairman Powell himself <clears throat> said monetary policy is working through expectations to a large extent. We can actually see that happening as they address this issue of the spread being so wide, so historically wide. How do they get back to the normal? And that's going to be a question that doesn't just apply to the Federal Reserve, but central banks around the world, Tom. Uh, Kriti Gupta, thanks so much. OPEC with some headlines. We'll get this out to you. Uh, uh, 111.30 on Brent crude up $1.16 right now. And, and, and John, there really is no other story right now. We go from the Fed yesterday, the Bank of England today. What will be the surprise in jobs tomorrow. Let's get to Guy Johnson in London. Guy, you and I have both shared that room with the Bank of England governor many times <clears throat> over the last decade or so. With Governor King when he had to look through higher inflation, with Governor Carney when people accused him of having a housing bubble and all kinds. In Brexit, Guy, time after time there were tough news conferences. Guy, I can't think of actually a tougher news conference than this one for this governor in his tenure. Absolutely. This, John, this is clearly an incredibly divided MPC. An incredibly, probably the most divided MPC I think I've ever seen. 
It, it is ironic in some ways that the bank is celebrating, celebrating today <laughs> 25 years of independence. Um, this is a really difficult situation that the bank find itself, finds itself with here. My initial reaction was it was a hawkish hike. They're clearly wrong. Look at what is happening uh, in the market right now. Um, I don't know where the bank is going to go next. The market is still pricing, John, 118 basis points of hikes between now and year end. That could be way off the mark. Um, is the Bank of England done? Is the Bank of England going to deliver further hikes? Bailey's talking about upside risk to inflation in the near term. RPI is going to be well into the double digits here. He's talking about the inflation pain that the UK population is going to feel. But he's also talking about the idea that, that when inflation comes down, <laughs> it's going to fall precipitously. And the idea here seems to be, John, that basically the Bank of England is going to use inflation to crush demand in the economy and bring inflation back down to target and potentially below target. The risk around that is massive. If you end up unanchoring un inflation right. expectations, the risk, Tom, of a wage price spiral is, is definitely there lurking in the wings. Guy Johnson, let me go to you, but John, jump in here as you see fit. John mentioned this earlier, Guy. I think we have a real understanding and surveillance of the relationship of Mr. Powell with Secretary Yellen with the administration in America. What is the relationship of the Bank of England to Mr. Sunak, Chancellor of the Exchequer? Tom, I'm going to dodge this. And the reason I'm going to dodge this is because there are polls open here in the UK today. And as a result of which, talk of fiscal policy is going to stray us into really? an area where I think regulators are going to have a little bit of an issue with us. Wow. Um, so let's park that for just a moment. OK, But fair. clearly that is, a, that is an issue that other central mm. banks are going to be thinking about. You look at what like is happening over on the other side of the English Channel, you think about what the ECB is doing right now, and they find themselves in a very similar position. Fiscal is going to have to do the heavy lifting for the ECB, Tom. Right. Nod, nod, wink, wink. But maybe we're going to see that, maybe okay, we're I, not. I, I don't, John, but certainly we're watching carefully. I mean, John, is this like if Guy screws this up with the election today, does he go to the Tower of London or is he forced to watch Tottenham? I think those days are gone, Tom. Oh, okay. Those days are gone, but I'll try and keep Guy out of trouble as well. Yeah. Guy, it's not clear to me how much distance there is between the dissenters today. There was a yep. set of individuals, the three that wanted a 50 basis point hike today and the two that wanted it to be over to signal to the market we're done now through the next couple of meetings. Guy, we're getting an understanding of that from Governor Bailey in this news conference, just how much distance there is between this group of people on the one side and another group on the other. We don't know who, the, who those two were, John, which I think is significant. And you've made the point to me that maybe actually it could be the two, it could be some of those that are voting for a 50 basis point hike, i.e. you front load it uh, and as a result of which you're done. But I come back to this idea that the market is still pricing 118 basis points. The market is still looking for significant hikes from here. If we are going to change that, that is going to be a huge vault fast for the market and the Bank of England. And once again, we are flip-flopping. We don't know what the reaction function of the Bank of England is. We don't know what guidance actually really looks like. It's interesting they haven't made a decision uh, on when they're going to start QT for gilts. Um, I don't know, John, what that distance is. This is an unbelievably murky picture surrounding the MPC right now. This is an unbelievably divided MPC. We seek further clarity. Who is it that has decided that we don't need any more from here? Are they the same people, as you suggest, uh, could be a possibility? I simply don't know the answer to that question. But we find ourselves, I think, with a lack of clarity that the market is struggling to price here. And as a result of which, I think the instinct is to look at the economic numbers that the bank is projecting and say, actually, if those are the numbers, the bank is going to find it really hard to hike into a recession. Guy, awesome to catch up with you, buddy, as always, and looking forward to the show a little bit later. Guy Johnson picking things up later on Bloomberg TV, taking you into the close, and on Bloomberg Radio <laughs> a little bit later as well. The issue, I think, for a lot of people today is just how transparent the Bank of England is being here. The dynamic is tough. Upside risk to inflation, downside risk to growth. We've talked about that repeatedly through this morning. But ultimately, at the same time, you've got a governor that can't really offer you a consensus because there isn't one. How do you reflect the consensus when there isn't a consensus at all? Is there a consensus all? in Washington? Right now on what, Tom? At the Fed? At the Fed. I'm not sure there I is. I think there's division of the Federal Reserve further down the road. How far they want to take this beyond 2%, beyond 2.5%. There's division right now at the Bank of England.
The uncertain outlook led to a range of views on the MPC. That was Governor Bailey moments ago. And that outlook right now for this British economy and for the economy around the world is incredibly uncertain. Cable, 123.82. You've got a move on pound sterling of two full percentage points against the US dollar. Futures right now, down a half of 1% on the S&P. From New York, this is Bloomberg. There are areas of the equity market, the global equity market, that have priced in what we think is the worst case scenario. At least some of this inflation is temporary and will start to ease. I think the job of the Fed right now is to show that they can bring inflation down. We're very sensitive to a little bit of loosening of this sort of Fed vice that we've been caught in. This is not a Fed that wants to do shock and awe. This is a Fed that wants to control the marketplace, let the medicine take hold. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. Jobs Day tomorrow, the Fed Day yesterday, this morning, history at the Bank of England, and it wraps into all of global Wall Street. John, you've lived it. Governor Bailey in a very small chair speaking to the British people. And looking to engineer a soft landing on a very, very small landing strip as well, Tom. And that's a tough task for this governor right now. Thanks. Forecasting at the Bank of England, double-digit inflation by year-end and potentially a contraction in the economy next year. And a Bank of England rate-setting committee that just does not know what to do this year. Within that, John, is the dissent. And, of course, Governor Bailey here doesn't agree with calls for a far bigger move. OK, fine. Is that dissent normal, John? The dissent we're seeing this morning is not normal. No. You've got two <clears throat> policy committee members who are essentially saying they want to be done for the next couple of meetings now. Exactly. And see what happens. You've got three that wanted a bigger move today. What's unclear to me is how much distance there is actually between the three that wanted a 50 basis point rate hike today, we've got 25, and the two <clears> that wanted to stop. I wonder how many of those three, if they'd got that 50 basis point rate hike, would also have been on the same page as those who want to stop now and wait and see. Either way, you have a classic central banking dilemma, don't you? When you have upside risk to inflation and downside risk to growth, it's terribly difficult to know what to do. And that's the position this governor is in today. And what's interesting, Andrew Sheets to join us here in a moment, folks. You get lucky sometimes, and to have Andrew Sheets with us will be great. Lisa Abramowitz, this alludes to something you've talked about, which is this idea of optionality forward. We heard it from Chairman Powell yesterday, making it up as we go to neutral versus forget about one and done. As John just mentions, Lisa, maybe it's two and done at the BOE. Basically, are they going to raise less than the market is currently pricing in because of this dilemma that they're facing? A question underscoring a lot of what Governor Bailey is talking about is, are wage increases good or bad? Basically, he said one of his hesitations from raising rates too much right now is because he doesn't want to curtail real wages, which are falling at such a hard pace. Even though there is tightness in the labor market, is that a bad yeah. thing or actually a good thing in order to soften the blow from some of these higher prices? And I think that's the dilemma right now as they try to take some of the momentum out of the economy, but not so much that it just exacerbates the pain. John, to start the day to check, intraday sterling 123.81. Just to see it with a 123 handle is quite something, Tom. A breakdown this morning, 123.98 and negative 1.8. 9%. The story elsewhere in the equity market, futures okay, down six tenths of 1%. We had almost a 3% move yesterday, so this just a little bit of a correction on the S&P. And the Nasdaq 100, negative eight tenths of 1%. The dynamic the Bank of England is confronting, is that the dilemma the ECB has to confront as well? Euro dollar back to 105.55, well, <clears throat> that currency pair, Tom, negative six tenths of 1%. Joining us now, the right person at the right time, Andrew Sheets joins us with his Brown Mathematics Chief Cross Asset Strategist at Morgan Stanley. Do the math, Andrew Sheets. At one point, it's about policy along the time continuum. How is Bailey's time continuum different from Powell, and as John Farrell mentions, Christine Lagarde's. Well, great. It's it's really nice to be here with you. So I, I think you, you put it rightly. These are three central banks, all with slightly different challenges. I think with the U.S., you have a clearly strong economy, and I, I think that's more of a classic challenge of central bank policy that's trying to slow a strong economy where unemployment's very, very uh, very strong and, and where a lot of that inflation is coming through the core parts of the inflationary channel. 
Now, for the ECB, it's it's different. The inflation is a lot less in the core elements uh, of CPI. The inflation is a lot more being driven by energy and food prices. And the risks to the economy are, are this very binary geopolitical risk to, to the energy markets, more so than probably kind of traditional slowing of fiscal policy or other factors. So, you know, I think when it comes to the ECB, there's there's a little bit more flexibility. You also have the ECB, which is in a negative rate scenario, unlike Bank of England and the Fed, getting out of negative rates is something we think there could be broader buy-in to. And then I think, as you alluded to, I think the Bank of England is in the toughest position of those three banks. It has a, a weak economy. UK growth is some of the weakest in the G7. It has a large current account deficit, unlike uh, the, the European, uh, unlike the Eurozone. And you have very high inflation, higher inflation than you have in, in the Eurozone uh, and, and comparable to the US. So I think this is a real challenge. I think we're seeing it come through the currency markets. And I think markets could continue to apply a higher risk premium there, given those higher challenges and higher uncertainty. Andrew, the Bank of England today is effectively communicating that a soft landing is the stuff of fantasy. Do you think that is true of the United States too? Well, not necessarily. I mean, I do think that the U.S. does have some shocks to its inflationary backdrop that are are unique, are being driven by geopolitical risks abroad, are being driven by supply chain concerns. And so I, I don't think it's unrealistic to think that the inflation numbers in the U.S. three, six months from now are coming down, which would mean that the wage picture starts to show real wage growth again. And that all starts to look a little bit better. You've also already priced in a 1994 style hiking cycle in the US. So I, I think it's fair to say that soft landings are difficult. There are, you know, they, they are less likely than more likely if we look back through a lot of, uh, of hiking cycles, but I, I don't think it's impossible. And I, I do think the important element here that we probably don't talk enough about is that the Fed is only part of this story. The, the other half of it is what fiscal policy is going to do, how fast or will it contract, and, and you know how do the U.S. midterm elections affect that? And again, we're some ways away from knowing how that will affect policy in 2023. Andrew, I definitely want to double down on that whole midterm election question, but this is not the moment as we talk about the potential for stagflation. How long can the U.S. remain the only one, right, the only major economy that's avoiding a stagflation-like kind of environment if you have the Bank of England addressing something very similar to that as well as the ECB? Well, it does put the U.S. in a difficult place because I think, you know, Lisa, as you correctly mentioned, the U.S. being this strongest house in the neighborhood is leading to a lot of dollar strength, which is only tightening U.S. financial conditions further. So it's, it's not just that the U.S. economy is facing a more hawkish Fed. It's also facing a, a much stronger dollar. And, and those Fed in, interest rate increases in dollar strength are both doubling up. On, on slowing the economy down. So that is a challenge that, that the Fed's gonna face. That's one of the reasons why we do not think that the market is underpricing the Fed. We think you know, the market currently pricing the terminal rate around three and an eighth, three and a quarter is, is about right. And part of that is, well, the dollar is also up a lot, which will also slow the economy. But it is gonna be important that, that growth elsewhere picks up. It is gonna be important, especially in Europe, where our base case is for actually quite reasonable growth this year, but you still have this enormous uncertainty around the energy security picture, which makes it hard to have as much confidence in that forecast as we would like. So Andrew, how does this equate uh, into some sort of strategy? Are you buying longer term treasuries on this conviction that you are gonna get a slowdown? And are you doubling down, frankly, on US assets? Well, so we, we do think that U.S. 10-year rates are pretty fair at current levels. We would no longer be underweight. We, we closed our underweight position in Treasuries earlier this month. But we think, you know, around 293% on the 10-year when you've already priced in a 94-style hiking cycle and when we think growth is going to slow in the U.S. with all this tightening of financial conditions, as inflation also moderates, that seems pretty pretty reasonable. And so I do think a lot of investors have been underweight duration correctly, but we think this is now a time to start moderating that position. Um, you know, I think this is also an environment that is very well suited for oil and, and for energy to outperform within the commodities complex. You know, we think the oil curve remains very backwardated, which means investors are paid very well to hold oil. 
And if we think about inflationary risk, it's very hard for us to see those happening in any way that does not involve higher oil prices over the medium term. So that's another asset class that we think outperforms on a broad cross-asset basis. Andrew, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. As always, Andrew Sheets there of Morgan Stanley following that call over the last week. Essentially, Lisa, saying that the long end has peaked for now. Yeah, basically saying that what we're looking at is what's going to be a slowdown because of what's going on. And frankly, this fascinating uh, confluence of events where you've got a strengthening dollar that's tightening policy as much as some of the rate hikes. I don't think we've made enough about that at a time when the dollar strength just is incredibly resilient. Since the dollar strength right now, aren't we, yeah. in a big way against one particular currency? Yeah. Tom Sterling, 124.10, just this move of 1.75% yeah. on the day. 11.9% rounded up 12% of the acclaimed DXY index, a lesser percentage of the Bloomberg dollar uh, index. And John, looking at DXY at 103, I mean, there's some other factors uh, going on here, including yen, which hasn't moved. But you just, as Andrew Sheets talked about, you wonder where currency comes in as a release valve for these oddities in the system of economic slowdown, and yet we've got to raise rates. I mean, I've never seen it. I know you're super focused on crude too, Tom. Brent at 111, just short of 112. This WTI is a, at 109. John, a backstory. This is a huge unspoken deal to see diesel do what it's doing in America and, frankly, in war-torn uh, Europe. And a gallon of gas, I'm sorry, it's creeping up. Acknowledging these problems over at the Bank of England, Lee, so the governor essentially communicating to the audience, to the people of the UK, that we face a problem. And he understands the pain they're going through. And part of that is the energy price story. How do you then adjust monetary policy to deal with that? Because that's not exactly something they can influence. I mean, they can't pump more oil at the Bank of England. And it's tough. It is really, really difficult right now to set policy in a world like this one. Paul Sankey's going to join us shortly. Great guest on the commodity market. Founder and lead analyst at Sankey Research coming up next. From New York, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. OPEC and its allies have stayed the course. The alliance has agreed to raise our oil output by the expected 432,000 barrels a day for June. Still, most countries in OPEC Plus are struggling to keep pace with their rising output allowances. And Elon Musk has won the backing of some of the world's biggest investors for his proposed $44 billion takeover of Twitter. According to a filing, Musk secured about $7.1 billion of new financing commitments. The investors include crypto exchange Binance, Brookfield, Fidelity and Qatar Holding. Plus, billionaires Larry Ellison's trust committed a $1 billion. Ellison has a stake in Musk's Tesla and a seat on its board. And the Bank of England has raised interest rates to their highest level since the financial crisis. Plus, it warned the economy is on course to shrink under pressure from double-digit inflation. The quarter-point rate increase to 1% was backed by six of banks' nine policymakers. The other three wanted a half-point hike. And Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky is trying to crowdfund the war with Russia. Zelensky has announced that Ukraine has launched United24, an online platform to raise money from anywhere in the world. He said that together the war with Russia can be stopped and what Russia has destroyed can be rebuilt. And those shares of Shopify are falling. The Canadian e-commerce company posted quarterly revenue and profit that missed estimates. Shopify also announced a $2.1 billion deal for startup Deliver. It's the company's largest acquisition ever. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. due to the invasion and to Covid developments, particularly in China. These developments have exacerbated greatly the challenges already facing the UK and many other economies from the series of adverse supply shocks that we continue to face. Monetary policy therefore must navigate a narrow path between the increased risks from elevated inflation and a tight labour market on one hand and the further hit to activity from the reduction in real incomes on the other. That's the tough spot this Bank of England governor is in right now. That was Andrew Bailey just moments ago saying that no one advocated for a 75 basis point increase. Let's be clear, that's not having quite the same effect that Chairman Powell had saying the same thing 
just yesterday. Equity futures this morning, and good morning to you. Negative a half of 1% on the S&P. A monster move high yesterday on the S&P 500. The biggest one-day rally going back to 2020, <laughs> up by almost 3%. Yields coming in just a little bit down, not even a basis point now, to 293.27. The euro is a whole lot weaker, the dollar a whole lot stronger after the move yesterday, 105.66 with negative a half of 1%. But the big move is pound sterling, 123.92. We are down by 1.9%. That is a weaker pound sterling, TK, in a yeah. big, big way. And I would respectfully suggest, folks, to get every second of value we can here, that Benjamin Broadbent, Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, ex-Goldman Sachs, truly one of the giant lights of uh, uh, United Kingdom economics, and Governor Bailey, they would like to listen to Paul Sankey. He is founder and lead analyst at Sankey Research with an absolutely blistering note for a two-hour conversation. Paul, I want to go to the nitty-gritty of your expertise, which is you link Henry Hub and LNG into a net gas explosion in price and profit. Discuss that. Well, supply, U.S. production is not uh, reacting to high prices. So a lot of our normal elasticities are simply not there. And, and the other key one is that coal prices are very high and coal inventories are very low. So the U.S. Uh, price, as you know, as you mentioned, has gone to $8.50 per MMBTU, which is, you know, a 15-year high. And I've got clients that think it's going to 20. So the reason, obviously, wow. is that Europe is cutting off Russian gas. And uh, as a result, they have to import as much LNG as they can. They were dependent on the spot market, so they don't have long-term contracts. And as a result, effectively, they're having to buy LNG from a buyer, from someone who's already got the contract <clears throat> right. in Asia. And to put so it, it's, it's a mess. And to put it in scale, folks, net gas, we frame it two, three. It's now eight. And Mr. Sankey just said we should enjoy at 20. Paul Sankey, let's look at the United Kingdom and the United States gallon of gas. And I understand there's taxes and John drives a little car over there. I get it. But it's $4.58 up 26% to United Kingdom $5.79. You say the profits are out there for big oil like you've never seen in 30 years. It goes back to Jurgen and the prize, the whole thing. What's a gallon of gas going to cost in three or five years? Well, I think we're going to hold 110 to 150. We've, we've wobbled below 110, as you know, on Brent, but now we're back in the range that I anticipated after Russia. And the core was that it would be a quagmire in, uh, in Ukraine, and that would, over time, the longer that went on, the more Russian oil and gas we would lose. Now we're focused on May the 9th for uh, the, you know, the, the key date in Russia where they celebrate the, uh, the victory over the Nazis. And we're wondering what's going to happen, but that could be a key, uh, a key catalyst state, whether or not Putin declares victory, whether or not he goes to all out um, you know, bombing. I don't know what he's going to do, but, but we're watching that date carefully. But what we do know is that Russian oil and gas has now effectively gone from the market as far as the EU is concerned. And that's a very, very big deal for markets, which were already tight, as you know, before this all kicked off. Paul, a lot of this goes to how much can people keep betting on oil companies at a time when there's a lot of complaints, especially on the regulatory and political side, about how much gas prices are going up, how much oil prices are going up. Well, at the same time, there is this uncertain backdrop on the macroeconomic picture. Shell just reported a record profit. We've seen this time and time again. How much more upside is there in these companies, given the 50 percent rally year to date, given the fact that there is all of this regulatory uh, scrutiny? Uh, you know, that's the number one concern of the clients. So, that, you know, the, the, the buy side, obviously, is my clients, the investors in oils are worried that the, the government won't tolerate, the U.S. government, for example, won't tolerate 10 or $20 Henry Hub gas because of the impact it'll have on, on the U.S. consumers. But, you know, the government's very weak. And they don't have uh, an energy policy, and they have a couple of key senators, uh, you know, Joe Manchin, obviously, who oppose any kind of interference in markets. And it's complicated to interfere in the gas market. It's a free market. These guys are selling gas directly by contract through processing hubs like Chenier. Um, and you know, to, to to shut that down as a government would be would be difficult without legislation. And legislation, we think, is very difficult. So I think, you know, much like the OPEC meeting that you just asked me about before we came on, uh, they're kind of powerless. You know, there's not much they can do. And we're just at the mercy of the market. 
And that's why it's such a, a crazy uh, environment for the oils, because, you know, the money they're going to make is going to be enormous and it will infuriate people. But what are you going to do about it? It's been a nuts environment, that's for sure. Paul, thank you, as always, buddy. Paul Sankey there of Sankey Research. We're crewed at Brent, 111.82 at 1.5%, TKWTI at 1.3% to 109.20. What's great here, John, is, as Mr. Sankey just mentioned, this idea of a feeling of powerlessness. Is the Fed trying to be an institution where we're in control and the Bank of England is maybe, John, being a little more honest and saying... We're really not sure the power that we have. It's sort of navel-gazing, but I, I really wonder the difference in languages. Questioning stunning. the honesty of the Federal Reserve is problematic for me to do, <clears throat> Tom, although I'm happy to do so if you wish. They're being transparent at the Bank of England about the future in a way that the Federal Reserve yeah, is not. They're, they're engaging in debate, folks, which is true of all of economics. And the, the heritage is there, John, let's be honest, about a much more fractious, invisible... Uh, discussion at the Bank of England, but and and, and to, to one of our guests who mentioned it, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember, John. What does this mean for ECB? What lesson do they take from the tumult today? This is the problem, the challenge for the ECB. They're at negative fifty, negative fifty basis points on the depot rate, so they're already at a much lower interest rate setting than the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England was. June 9th is the policy decision at the ECB, and I would suggest that this is a difficult one. They've got to wind down QE, we know that. They've got to talk about engineering the first rate hike. We know that. But this was the question I had as soon as the Bank of England hiked back in December. It was how far are you going to take yeah. this? How far can you take this? <clears throat> and here we are with a challenge well, from the growth outlook. John Sterling breaking down now. New weakness this morning, 123.68. It's ugly, TK. It is ugly. Tomorrow we have a jobs report in the United States of America, and we will catch up with the chief economist at ADP next. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York, for our audience worldwide on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your equity market shaping up as follows. About an hour out from the opening bell. We're negative six-tenths of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq down three-quarters of 1%. A bit of economic data coming out in just a moment. Let's cross over to Mike McKee down in D.C. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, it's not directly related to tomorrow's jobs report, but the number of people filing for first-time unemployment benefits ticks up a significant amount given where we are, up to 200,000 from uh, 185,000 uh, the prior week. So a 15,000 gain now, uh, that's uh, statistically insignificant, basically. But it does tell you that uh, there are still people who are, for one reason or another, looking for unemployment insurance. But as I said, this was not the reference week for jobs. So uh, tomorrow's numbers aren't going to be affected by this. The other number that is out today that is uh, bad news is non-farm productivity down 7.5% in the first quarter. That is from a 6.3% gain in the fourth quarter. And it just shows you the swing in GDP made a big difference in productivity. Unit labor costs rise 11.6% yeah. after rising 1% in the fourth quarter. And let me just check here. Uh, that is the most since 19, uh, well, since 2020, which of course is uh, going to be because of the pandemic. But I'll have to see uh, wh what the lowest, uh, the, the, rather the highest that is in terms of unit labor costs before that was. Uh, you probably have to go back 2014. to... Yeah, 2014. So <laughs> at this point, it looks like um, Companies are paying up and getting less for it. At least they were in the first quarter. Right. Mike, let's get a clinic on that while you were yammering away there. And it's really hard for Mike McKee to do this, folks, with the headlines coming out. I went to unit labor costs in a fancy chart here. And basically, the longer-term moving average of unit labor costs, Michael McKee, get us back to the early 1990s. What does that signal about wage inflation that we may see tomorrow? Well, it... it uh Suggest, the numbers suggest that we probably will see continued wage inflation. Also, the fact that the unemployment rate is forecast to tick down to 3.5%, and we, uh, we may not see a lot of gain in uh, the labor force. So we are expecting wages to go up. Jay Powell said 
the uh, labor market is extremely tight. But you want to go back to the 1990s. What happened then was Alan Greenspan raised interest rates by 300 yeah. basis points. And we did not have a recession. Instead, we got a very long, very strong expansion. So I guess there's two paths that we can follow here from here. Payrolls on Friday tomorrow, Mike, on to CPI next week. Just looking at one of the estimates from Morgan Stanley, 8.1% down from 8.5. Then you get into core and the month over month figures too. Mike, away from payrolls into CPI next week, what's the focus for you? Well, it's going to be the core rate because we know that we're going to see energy and food price pressures continue, especially with uh, what's going on with Ukraine and Russia. So is the core rate slowing down? We saw that in the PCE numbers last week, uh, the, the Fed's favorite indicator of inflation. And uh, if the core rate is moderating, that would give the Fed some hope that their interest rate increases would have an effect. Uh, but we also want to see, look at what housing is doing, because that's going to take a long time to come down, and it has added a lot to price pressures in CPI. Mike, awesome work yesterday, buddy, by the way. Great to see you back in the room, <clears throat> in the news conference, getting back to it Chairman Powell. Yeah, Isn't that good to see, Tom? Just good. to get them back <laughs> no. together again. It's like a reunion yeah. for economists down Well, in we're Washington. seeing that in all sorts of things, and it does speak to the optimism and James Bullard talking about this, John. I mean, let's review that quickly here before Neela Richardson. I mean, the gentleman from St. Louis has an optimism of a resilient American economy. The gentleman from St. Louis is scheduled to speak tomorrow for the people that are interested. I did not know that. In the evening, alongside Governor Waller, right. too. A couple of Fed speakers tomorrow that are going to be quite interesting. Bramer, just to go through the data, 200K, upside surprise, historically still very low for initial jobless claims. I know unit labor costs caught your eye as well. This, to me, is really concerning for the Fed at a time when you do have this tightness in a labor market that's not necessarily being reflected in the numbers the way perhaps they have traditionally. The idea that it's on the wrong way up, the fact that we're getting an acceleration right. in wages rather than some sort of deceleration. Is this a good thing mm. or a bad thing? As we saw from the Bank of England, you need wage increases so that people can keep up with the price of inflation. The problem is that could exacerbate how far inflation can go. With ADP, their chief economist, wonderfully attuned to the dynamics of the American economy. Neela Richardson joins us right now. Neela, I'm looking at core CPI that John just mentioned, and I guess it's a pause that McKee just mentioned. We migrate from 6.5 to 6.1 percent on the survey on core inflation. 114 percent of our audience on radio and TV thinks people like McKee, Farrell, Keene, and the rest are nuts saying that's a good trend. How much does that trend have to move down to where we can begin to relax? Uh, hi, Tom. Thanks for starting off with an easy question. I, I, I think we, we're going to stay on the edge of our seats until we see that core inflation move down below 3%. Yeah. I, I, I think that we can't um, take it as a foregone conclusion that it moves down in a straight line either. Um, many on your show have said that the Fed can only do so much, that this is a supply uh, side issue as much of it as a demand issue. And so we might see inflation bounce around even in the core rate. Uh, and so uh, comfort is, I think, of below 3%. Neely, do you think that people interpreted yesterday's press conference correctly? No, I don't. Um, I think that it was way too easy for the Fed, and I know that's part of their job. Their job is to make it look easy, but it's not about what the markets do the day after the press conference. It's what the inflation does months from now, and we haven't seen it yet. And the numbers that Mike just read are, are concerning. Productivity went down, wages went up. Uh, and so that's not the place where the Fed wants to be. They want, if wages are going up, it's because the economy is getting more productive, not because uh, we have this super tight, unhealthy supply shortage. And I think that is the concern. Wages may not boost inflation, uh, but wage growth could keep it around a lot longer than anyone's expecting right now. Another thing that uh, really a lot of people picked up on that Jay Powell said yesterday was that he really sees the core rate, uh, the target rate, still be around 2 to 3 percent in terms of how far they will raise rates. Do you think that that's something we can take at face value? Or do you think that perhaps there is more willingness than perhaps was reflected to go beyond that into a tightening that perhaps uh, was what people were pricing in earlier this week, but not now? <laughs> well, I, I think that that uh, 
for now in terms of the fundamentals, which are strong and, and where the Fed is guiding towards, I think that's appropriate. I, I'm always struck by this comparison with 1994 going from six to 11 versus where we are not now going from rock bottom zero to three. We're still in the school zone in terms of rate hikes. We are not on the open highway. So I think uh, what the Fed is, is trying to say is that they can maneuver a soft landing given that we're starting from such a very low point on the federal funds rate. You were out at Indiana University which I believe is a stomping ground of one James Bullard. John Farrell says Mr. Bullard will speak tomorrow. And Indiana, folks, is a really acclaimed, interesting mathematics and economics uh, combine. Neela, there's a different view out in Indiana. It's an optimism that America can heal and move on away from the elites on the East Coast. Is that still in place? Can we technologically move on and move forward like that Indiana optimism? I'll have to note, Tom, that Governor Waller is also an IU uh, affiliate, too. Oh, so we, we have a good representation on the in the Federal Reserve System right now. Um, you know, I think that the optimism around innovation and pro productivity is warranted. Um, that's what makes the wage gains good for the economy. That's what leads to profitability. Um, and we've seen a a big uptick in innovation just to get through the pandemic. A lot of things that were uh, expected well into the future in terms of e-commerce right. and I can, AI, automation have been pulled forward. So the question <clears throat> is, can the economy build on that momentum on those gains right. uh, to keep that pro productivity moving forward? John, I love this that we have Neela on. And I'm sorry, John, there's just not enough Midwest, you know, freshwater representation in the economic discussion. You get guys like Jerome Powell, who are a beast of finance on the East Coast. Neela, we have to run. Thank you. Then we'll do the job for class <laughs> Thanks so much. a little bit later. Neela Richardson there of ADP. Thank you very much. Tom, to Nita's point about this data that came out just a moment ago, productivity down, unit labor costs up. Walk me through that, Tom. Just walk everyone through okay. that, why that is so complex and difficult. Okay. And on radio, this is really difficult because I got the proverbial radio hands up. John, there's one ratio. There's a lot of that. Sterling, dollar sterling, you know, one, one fraction. Then there's other relationships that are two fraction. There's even equity relationships that are five fractions, but productivity as a general statement is the moving parts of three different relationships, three different fractions. And what Neil is saying is the dynamics of those three moments right now are unit labor costs are going the wrong way and productivity is going the wrong way, the efficiency of the American economy. And that, that's just not the right kind of productivity, the right kind of dynamics within that interesting relationship. Uh, Lisa, it's problematic. I'm looking right now at unit costs just on a historical perspective. The last time, aside from the pandemic disruptions, that we saw unit costs of labor rising at this kind of pace, twice in 2004, and then I can't find any more going back decades, right? So this is basically <clears throat> giving you a sense of how historic the wage gains have been, how historic the labor costs <clears throat> are, have been at a time yeah. when we're not seeing more for <clears throat> it. This is not what they want to see. And, John, this goes back to Professor Romer yesterday, the laureate, and this phrase that's always tough to explain, total factor productivity. And as Ms. Richardson just stated, the pandemic sped it all up. Looking ahead to payrolls, your estimate, 380K. In the month of March, the number was 431,000. Coming up, Lisa Hornby is going to be joining us on the market, fixed income and everything that happened with the Fed yesterday. Joining us from Schroeder's. Also, Jonathan Golub of Credit Suisse on his recent downgrade oh, on the S&P. And Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo around the <coughs> opening bell. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Billionaire Larry Ellison is just one of the well-known investors agreeing to back Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter, according to a filing crypto exchange Binance, Brookfield, Fidelity and Qatar Holdings will also have given new financing commitments totaling $7.1 billion. Plus, Saudi prince Awalid bin Talal has agreed to roll over his current investment in Twitter. OPEC and its allies once again agreed on a small monthly increase in production. It comes at a time when global markets are likely to get tighter because of the EU's proposed ban on Russian oil. OPEC Plus ratified a 432,000 barrel a day increase. Analysts doubt the alliance will be able to deliver even that much. 
And the coronavirus death toll probably climbed to almost 15 million people in its first two years. In other words, about one out of every 500 people worldwide. That's according to the World Health Organization. The new estimate is more than twice the figures from individual government reports. And Warren Buffett is boosting his bet on Occidental Petroleum. Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has bought up almost 6 million more shares of Occidental. Berkshire had previously built up a stake of more than 14% of the company. Occidental was the best performing stock on the S&P 500 during the first quarter. And BMW posted first quarter profits that beat estimates. The German automaker and its rivals have been hampered by the semiconductor shortage and other supply chain issues, so they have shifted production to higher margin models. BMW delivered 6% fewer cars, but revenue rose 17% over the previous year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. UK GDP growth is expected to slow sharply over the first half of the forecast period. That predominantly reflects the significant adverse impact of the sharp rises in global energy and tradable goods prices on most UK households' real incomes. The Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, with a very difficult task ahead for the unique economy that is the United Kingdom. It was not that he shocked the world today of finance, it is the dissent. It is Bank of England, and Lisa Bramo is just to frame this out. It was a dissent not seen yesterday at the Fed. Yeah, honestly, this has been a very difficult path for the Bank of England, <clears throat> and they have a very different trajectory than over at the Federal Reserve because they cannot even count on saying there is going to be growth next year, so seeing actually a contraction even amid hiking rates. And it is appropriate to end this hour, and we'll drive forward this story through the day on radio and television, with Mark Chandler. His book, Political Economy of Tomorrow, looked at the astrology of the foreign exchange system. He's chief market strategist at Bannockburn. Mark, you're a great student of this. I want to go back to 1992, I believe John Major, and essentially the modern collapse of the British financial system. Yes, there was a few other moments along the way, including Mervyn King. Compare and contrast what is coming for Governor Bailey and what John Major dealt with in 1992 with Sterling Collapse. Yeah, so, Tom, remember, in 1992, the U.K. was part of the exchange rate mechanism that limited how much the Sterling could move. It had trouble keeping into that, maintaining that band. And uh, now the U.K. has gotten its freedom. It's not limited by that band. And Sterling has collapsed. You know, yesterday... Chairman Powell talked it sort of like channeled Paul Volcker, but I think it's really Bailey who's doing it. Despite what Lisa was saying, the UK's the Bank of England's forecasting contraction in GDP next year, and still going to be stagnant in 2024, they're hiking rates. And not only hiking rates, but they also announced that starting September, they will begin selling right. off its corporate bond holdings. Mark, what will be the lessons here? And this, I think, folks of the great Jens Nordvig and Mark Chandler together on this. Mark Chandler, how does the ECB and a more conservative block at the ECB is represented by the Bundesbank? How do they respond to what is, we've seen this morning? I don't think that what happens in the Bank of England makes the ECB change their dynamics whatsoever. I do think the Hawks have been pressing for a July rate hike. But, and the market, the swaps market, has it priced in, a 25, a, about a 25 basis point hike in July. But I think that this is, this is scary in the sense that the, we saw that happen today with the factory orders in Germany, weaker than expected industrial output yes. in France. The, Europe, Europe as a whole, it's not just the U.K., but Europe as a whole looks to me like it's headed for a recession. Is that being priced into the euro right now, Mark? Well, I think partly, but I think that really what's priced into the euro is how aggressive the Fed is. I know a lot of people are critical of the Fed that they're behind the curve, but I think that they're playing catch-up. And it's not, just, it's not just that the Fed is behind the curve, something wrong with the Federal Reserve. But look what happened. Uh, Sweden, who said they weren't going to hike rates until 2024, hiked rates. And it's the same thing uh, that we've seen some other central banks, like the Reserve Bank of Australia, hiking rates. Even So I think that all the major central banks are behind the curve. But, but partly because I want to say in their defense that the pandemic... And then the Russian invasion of Ukraine 
And then the slowdown, the COVID sort of induced slowdown in China, is just, is just more than anybody had, would have expected or were able to, nothing in our experience to let us prepare for this. A lot of people are talking about the potential for recession in Europe. The Bank of England seeing a very high likelihood of recession in England and the United Kingdom in the face of these dynamics. In the U.S., there seems to be a consensus that that is not the near-term forecast, that there is so much of a, a momentum here underpinning the strength. Do you think that that's overstated, or do you think that people can bet on that, leading to even more dollar strength? Well, I do think they will get some more dollar strength here. And I think that tomorrow we're going to get the jobs report in the U.S. And I see the estimates falling a little bit, but we're still talking about 300, 380,000 increasing in jobs. It's hard for me to see a recession with that. So I am very sensitive to this. We are going to have a slowdown. I sort of just see it taking place later this year and into next year, not so much in the immediate, you know, in the, in the next quarter or two. We did have that sharp contraction in Q1 GDP, but that was really a statistical fluke, right, because of trade and inventory. What, we, what the economists call final fail to domestic purchasers was actually a relatively robust yeah. number. Mark, I want to go back to how we were all weaned on this because all of us began foreign exchange and banking by watching Julie Andrews and Mary Poppins. I mean, let's be honest, Dick Van Dyke stole the show. And Mark Chandler, there's a view of the Bank of England. I mean, Farrell grew up with this view of the Fidelity and Fiduciary Bank, which was the bank in the movie Mary Poppins. We have moved on from that, from, Mark, a new central bank that is supposed to have a new social construct. Is that social construct getting in the way of making tough decisions? I don't know. I mean, I mean look what they just did. They hiked rates. Six members, I mean, they all voted in favor of, the, excuse me, six voted in favor of the rate hike. Three of them wanted a 50 basis point rate hike, knowing full so well that the cost of living squeeze is going to be crushing the consumer and businesses in the U.K. I don't know. I don't see this as, as some kind of uh, give back to uh, the social, uh, social consciousness. Where I sort of see that happening is really in Mexico, where yesterday President AMLO announced a pact with businesses right. to limit the price increase of like 24 common products. Mike, uh, Mark, we got to leave it there. On short notice, Mark Chandler today with Bannockburn. I just love, love, love the tapestry, Lisa, that Mr. Chandler puts to the history and the social aspects of all this financial blather uh, that we do. You know what, Lisa, what I know is all of this is shown first in what you're expert at, which is the fixed income market. How do you presume debt on price and on yield adjust to what's been wrought in the last 48 hours? Another way to put this is how do you price in stagflation? How do you price in the risk of raising like rates yeah. at a time of slowing growth? And this is frankly a situation that some people, Chris Ailman actually of Calster is the second biggest U.S. public pension, came out yesterday and said there is no good trade when it comes to stagflation. Everything fails. And that's what we saw last month. Going forward, most people are saying in the U.S. Mm. we are going to avoid that. People are saying it is looking right. a lot less likely in Europe and frankly in the United Kingdom. How do you then situate yourself in a very perilous yeah. moment. Lisa, can we have a moment of silence right now? Please, let's Lawrence have a lot of moment. <laughs> On radio, <laughs> folks, we're going to do this right now. Let's be quiet. A moment of silence for Lauren Summers, as we have now. You know, he's a pinata, but, they, you know, Claudia saw him after him the other day and many others. Larry Summers is a pinata, but when you see the public policy action today that we saw from Professor Mann, Saunders, uh, Ben Broadbent, who's just outstanding, and Bailey. I'm sorry, policy and economics meet up with a crushing force every once in a while as summers lived. Although we don't really have an understanding of what the dissenters were going for. Were they trying to get ahead of, and this is what John was harping on, basically saying, were they trying to front load as many as possible and then being done with I, it and, and to sort of create a shock there? Or were they actually saying they needed to be no, more aggressive? I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, the joke is it's not one and done, it's two and done. And I don't know what the calendar is here, Lisa, but I do think it's a complete difference from Powell and the reaction function out to neutrality versus the let's go that we saw this morning. Thank you to Guy Johnson helping in London this morning as well. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg.